Special Operations. Covert Ops. Espionage. The Team House. With your hosts, Jack Murphy and David Park. Hey folks, welcome to episode 241 of the Team House. I'm Jack Murphy. Dave Park is out today, but we got co-host Jason Lyons. He was on the show way back in our early days when it was just like a bed sheet tacked behind the wall. So you have to scroll way down into the uh, archives to find uh, the interview with him. But our, our friend Jason served in the Marine Corps and as a CIA staff operations officer. We're really glad to have him filling in today. And our guest tonight is Yaya Fanusi. Yaya served as an economic analyst at CIA. He's also the, the, the brains behind the Jabari Lincoln Files, which is a podcast, a fictional espionage podcast that I've been listening to this week. Um, I think it has a really unique perspective. I think Yaya has a really unique perspective, and we're really excited to have him on the show tonight. So welcome, man. Hey, thank you both. Jack, Jason, great to be here. It's an honor to be on the podcast. Yeah, thanks for doing it, man. And a uh, quick shout out to one of our sponsors for uh, Vitamin One Water. Uh, you can go check them out at drinkvitaminone.com. The link's down in the description. They make an alternative to some of the other sports drinks you know. It has all the electrolytes in it, but it doesn't have any sugar in it. So please go check them out, drinkvitaminone.com. Um, so yeah, yeah, we'll start off with you, man. We'll uh, start at the beginning. Tell us a little bit about your background, your upbringing, and sort of like how that led you towards governmental service. Wow. Well, it's it's a long journey. I mean, I think I actually have to go back uh, back to the, my origin goes back to my, my family, my my parents. Um, you know, and where did I get the name? Yeah, yeah, Fanusi. So uh, my dad is originally from Sierra Leone, West Africa, and my mother is from here from the states and uh they met my dad came over in 1967 for college and so he he came over um and uh and so so they met they had me and my sister and i was born and raised in california so um you know my mom's african-american uh and my dad you know originally from from africa and uh so i grew up mostly in um the southern california area I grew up mostly in the san fernando valley um los angeles basically lived in the bay area for for a little while but yeah mostly california born and raised until um actually one part of my childhood i went to we went as a family to nigeria for a year so i think it was second grade so I, I, we were living in the bay area we were living in oakland and uh, my dad who had finished my dad got a phd uh, my mom got a phd also uh, she's a pharmacist uh, in pharmacology and my dad in um uh, public administration. So he went back to uh, West Africa. He couldn't go back to Sierra Leone. So he went to teach at a university in Nigeria. So we went, it was just me. My sister wasn't born yet. And I spent a year in Nigeria. So that was my first exposure, um, you know, my main exposure to, to Africa, to international, you know, the international world. So I was always so at a young age already exposed, right? I mean, my dad's, mm -hmm. my, you know, my dad background and, uh, and then, then ex that experience in Nigeria. Um, so which I your, think really your, impacted your, your, your so dad. We, we, you're, 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 I'm sorry to interrupt. I was going to point out. I mean, yeah. was was your dad then the sort of the first generation of post-colonial uh, South Africa, or I'm sorry, Sierra Leoneans that came to be educated in the West and then went back home afterwards? So, man. So, what can I say? What, what, what you my my dad's legacy is very yeah. interesting. So, I, you would you would. Um, you know, I hope he doesn't mind me saying this because he, he may listen to this. Yeah. Um, so my dad came of age in the 60s in the sort of um, post-colonial mm -hmm. and independence. I think, he, you know, uh, Sierra Leone got his independence probably when he was a young, like a teenager, young teen teenager or, so or something like that. Right. So he was part of that generation just coming out of uh, the colonial period, the independence period. And this is the 60s. Right. He came over in 67. And I will share something. Um, which this this is myth or reality, you all will, will, will have to choose. But this is what my dad tells you, because it's really a full circle moment. So my dad's 1967. He's a young man. And was very. this was the 60s in, 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 in Africa. He was very politically active. Mm. Um, you know, this is the you know newly independent. Sierra Leone had been in, independent for a few years. And so he's very active and he's with a lot of the active activist people, sort of independence, you know, post-colonial people, young young men in Sierra Leone. So this is the story that I've been told. 
I've been told that there was someone at the U.S. State Department in Freetown, the capital of, of Sierra Leone, who took an interest in my dad. And um, uh, this diplomat was really watching all the political, the young political uh, guys in in Sierra Leone. Sierra Leone is an English speaking uh, uh, um, country for, for those that don't know, formerly British. It's where actually Freetown, where, where uh, uh, freed slaves were, were settled. Um, so there's a really interesting history there. But anyway, so my dad says that. Um, you know, they took an interest because he was he was one of the young rabble rousers in in Sierra Leone. And at that time, Cold War, there was actually there was this pool that, you know, the Soviet Union was trying to recruit students yeah. to go to Russia mm -hmm. and to and to and to Eastern Europe. And that you had that element uh, in Sierra Leone trying to recruit these young, young guys. And uh, from what I understand, someone at the, the U.S. Uh, embassy said, no, 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 no. We don't want them. We don't want him to go there. Let's get him. Let's, ha let's have him go to United. We do not want this guy with, with the Soviets. And 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 basically, um, you know, so he got a scholarship to to come and study uh, to come and study in the United States. And so the funny thing is, like, there's a lot of like, you know, un under there's an undercurrent here. So years later, because I didn't even know this. I don't think my dad told me. But years later, my dad got in touch with, I think, on Facebook that diplomat oh, that wow. guy who you know maybe he wasn't really you know who he said he was yeah. uh uh and apparently you know it, it's interesting because my dad got a fulbright scholarship to come to the united states and then when i was in college i actually got a fulbright scholarship oh, to go wow. to west africa mm -hmm. but um but um so my dad reached out to this to this uh to this gentleman years later you know before he died uh before this this gentleman died that was in sierra leone <laughs> and he told him about me he said well you know my son ended up working for you guys uh you know years later and the guy told him that's great i got two for one <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah the story you I mean the, the family lore uh, i haven't really i've never told this story publicly but the family lore is is that you know that was a part of my dad coming here he settled met my mom and um and sierra leone got very poli politically it was difficult difficult so he couldn't go back so he went to nigeria to study i mean to to teach and that's what brought us to uh, to, to Nigeria for that one. We came back actually from Nigeria. Uh, we moved to my um, to my grandmother's home where uh, where she, where she lived in in South Central LA. Uh, so I went from Zaria, Nigeria, to South Central LA, and uh, spent a little <laughs> bit of time there. Then we moved out uh, to the Valley, San Fernando Valley, and um, and I always had this you know this international awareness. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. But I went through some. You know, I don't know. Should I pause there? Because no, I mean, no, I didn't no. even get to go. Go, go yeah. ahead. Tell the story the way you want to tell it. OK, so, you know, I, I would say I I went on a journey um, because, you know, I'm probably not. You probably wouldn't think that I would go to to the career that I went on to. Um, so let me let me list some context. Right. So, you know, I'm I'm uh, you know, I'm in my late 40s. So I came of age in in the late 80s and 90s in terms of being a teenager. And this was, at the time, I was impacted by the culture of the, of, of the time, right? I mean, you, I mean, you, you guys, I'm sure, remember, this was this was the hip hop time. I yeah, came yeah, of age, yeah. you know, I mean, you know, you know, you know all, the, all those groups from, from, from the late 80s, the conscious hip hop, the political hip hop, mm -hmm. the public enemies, um, you know, Afrocentric, that was, hey, that was a part of my, my youth and my, my childhoods. And I, you know, I was actually the, the Black Student Union president at my school in high school. Um, and so I was, you know, wearing the daishikis and, you know, uh, the Africa pin on my black the hat. Medallion. I mean, it was, you know, that was, I mean, you 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 remember that time, right? Um, so you wouldn't think I would go on to join the CIA. Um, you know, and especially I I think my my background, my dad's background, and you know, it so so how did that happen? Um, cause I think even a lot of people wonder, like some, some of my, you know, high school and college folks are probably like, what, how, how did you go to the agency? <laughs> you were not the kid. You were not the guy who we would have <laughs> think. And, um, I guess the, the short story is my own maturity. I think I kind of sort of peaked early in the sense of like my sort of that, that, that age as a youth, like 14, like 15, 16, 17, right. When I was really into that. Um, I was really into it. And I think when I got to college, um, I was very much interested in education and youth mentorship. All the jobs I had when I was in college, I went to UC Berkeley um, for my undergraduate and, and studied economics. 
And so, so you can see, like, I, I was already thinking internationally because I studied economics and I was thinking a lot about international development. I got to travel. I did some research in Zimbabwe. This is in the, in the 1996. Um, I traveled to the Caribbean for, for a program at our school. So I was really thinking internationally. But when I was back at home or when I was at school, all the jobs I had dealt with education. I was um, doing tutoring. I was uh, helping run a mentorship program that was in West Oakland. Uh, and so it really exposed me to, you know, what, what, what is needed in our world? What is needed um, for our youth and for our communities? And so I think I had a, a lot of maturing. That's one thing, right? I was just seeing a lot of the sort of political rhetoric that maybe I was listening to in my early years of hip hop. And then I was seeing how, you know, I was just maturing, I think, in my understanding of well, what are the dynamics at, at, at work? What what do you what do our youth really need to do? What's really going to help the the situation, especially the African American situation, and um, and so that so I was maturing and developing. But then there was something else that happened, which was towards the end of my college career, um, you know, I had my own sort of spiritual journey. I mean, if if we can, you know, if if it's okay for me yeah, to, yeah, to go yeah, there yeah, for sure. Um, so again, maybe I'm oversharing a little bit, but you know, my, um, well, so, so I'll just say this when I was in college, I think I was going through some, some sort of spiritual searching and I remember a few things that affected me. And one of the biggest moments in my life that I think made me more spiritual was the death of my grandmother. Remember my grandmother in, in California, we, we moved, we lived with her for a little while. Um, and, um, my parents did get divorced eventually, but, 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 um, and I, you know, was, you know, but my father was always in my life. I mean, my father was, you know, he lived in Oakland. We were in Southern California. So, you know, I was always connected to my dad. Um, but I remember when my mom's mom passed, I, here I am like this real sort of political cultural guy. And I remember I started thinking a lot about, about life and, you know, my grandmother passing and, and I just started to reflect more about man, well, the spiritual side of things. Now, in terms of background, like where, what was my background? I mean, I, I would say, you know, raised in a, you know, I would say probably nominally Christian um, household. You know, my father was not very religious. I, mean, I think my mother, mother was, you know, raised Christian. And um, and so I think and my grandmother, her influence, I always remember, you know, talking to her. I remember talking to her and, you know, just things that she would share with me. So when she passed, you know, I think I started to think more about religion and about spirituality. And hey, I was in the Bay Area. I did my little, you know, I was doing yoga and I was doing all, you know, you know, the whole typical things that you, you get in college, searching and going to different things. And all while I'm like, you know, doing my academics, traveling, like, so this was like a period of growth. And, um, and, to, and to top it off, because this is all going to be connected, hopefully, in, in talking about the podcast. And, and, and I was in the radio, I had a radio show um, in college at KALX, CalX, 90.7 FM, Berkeley. Um, and so I'm listening to music, getting into jazz, John Coltrane, you know, all these sort of spirit, you know, John Coltrane was a very spiritual minded jazz musician, you know, all of these influences are affecting me. And um, lo and behold, at one point, and, you know, we can go into details if, if we need to, but, you know, to sum it up, I basically uh, found the path for me of, of Islam. You know, I, I converted to Islam during my last, really my last semester at Berkeley. So I had sort of gone through my experience at, at, at Berkeley. And then, um, and then, yeah, I just, I just, um, I just found, you know, Islam for me. And so, uh, so I became Muslim, you know, at the tail end of, right before I graduated. And it's interesting because most people would think, and this is the late 90s, this is 97, I guess, uh, when I'm graduating and going through this experience, and most people would, would think, you think about the time where, where we're in, right? There's a pre 9-11. Mm -hmm. And you would think like, okay, well, was that, you know, potentially that could have been, a, I mean, hey, we, we know what happened to folks like John Walker Lind, right? And and uh, and and Adam, what's his name, right? Um, oh, Adam Gadon. Adam Gadon, mm -hmm. right? Like those, that was those guys in the late 90s, right? What's interesting was I, for me, <clears throat> religion, I actually think was a, I hate to use this term, but almost like, a moderating force or counter radicalizing force in the way that I saw it and came to it, because I think I had gone through my my high school years where, 
you know, I was thinking more about the politics. Like you think about someone like Malcolm X. And I remember in high school reading Malcolm X's autobiography and I wasn't really into his religious transformation. I was more into like his political commentary back then because that's what I was into, you know, in the, right. in the early 90s. Um, but then but then this transformation, as I started to get more spiritual, it actually made me see how a lot of the political polemics were um, distracting from like the universal principles that you find in religion. Mm -hmm. And for me, Islam was and I was reading. And the funny thing was, I didn't have like I wasn't really learning from some person. I didn't really know any other Muslims at this time. It was really self study. I had one one good friend who was who was Muslim who kind of, you know, you know, gave me a book or a book or so. And I talked to him, but it was mostly a very self study. I wasn't thinking about what's happening in the Muslim world. It was really just reading, you know, reading from reading from the book, reading from the Quran, learning about, you know, the principles of the faith and the, the, the history in a very, you know, um, you know, just a, I don't know, a reflective sort of way. And, and so that, you know, just made me. And when I was reading, like it, it's so funny when when radical like when 9-11 happened and when we're learning later, I became a counterterrorism analyst. And in learning about all those things, it was so interesting because, you know, those the jihadist propagandists, you know, that was a big thing. We could talk about like, you know, when I joined the agency and when I went to the CT world, that was at the height of, of AQ. That was the, at the height of Al Qaeda. Um, and you know, I went over to the National Counterterrorism Center and, you know, whenever, you know, bin Laden back then or, or Zawahiri or whoever, or Adam Gadan, right, had their propaganda videos and they would, you know, they would quote you know, either verses mm. or they would point to parts of Islamic history, right, that that would resonate, that they would feel would resonate with the Muslim populace. And it's interesting because they would point to things which, you know, yeah, when I was learning and reading, like I was reading you know, learning the reading from the Quran myself, reading some of the commentary. And I never I never arrived at the conclusion that these guys got to. Right. And I was just a convert just trying to figure it out myself. So it's it's interesting that um, depending on how, you know, someone can shape the yeah. same yeah. verse or scripture that you're that that you're identifying with, how they shape it could impact how you develop. Um, I had another influence, which I think is really the key to how I could transform myself and, and, and join the CIA. Um, so when I converted to Islam, I was, like I said, I was sort of on my own. Um, and I, you know, I was just about to graduate and then I left to go, I got the Fulbright to go to West Africa. I went to Ghana for a year before I started grad school. So I wasn't like in one neighborhood or community or mosque or anything. I went straight to Ghana, basically, um, had the opportunity when I was in Ghana to make the Hajj, to make the pilgrimage to, to Mecca while I was there. Cause here I was a newly graduated student. I had my, my, my research, my Fulbright money and I was close and I was like, when am I ever going to be able to do this? So I just, I made the Hajj, you know, right then and there. And, um, and, uh, and so I was able to see different Muslim, um, countries perspectives right because i'm because i'm I'm an, I'm an american and i'm learning and i'm media and, and going on hajj was interesting because when i went on hajj you know there's a mix you, ha you have all these muslims from all over the world different countries muslims from china muslims from iran from indonesia from egypt etc and so you're seeing how everyone has like a, their own take or their own approach you you know women and gender like a funny thing when when I was with um, I was with the Ghanaians, I was with a Ghanaian delegation when I went. And so I'm with hanging out with all these Ghanaians, West Africans and their women, um, the, the, the women that are on Hajj from the uh, from Ghana, like they're working. They're like business women. They're like you come out, you know, you, you wake up, you come out and they're like chefing up stuff. You know, they're making money on the Hajj, which is all good. You can make money, you know, on the outskirts, you know, when you're not doing the rituals. And I'm seeing this, you know, this this interaction between men and women. And then when I walk into when I'm in, in in Mecca or Medina and you walk into like a store and I don't see any women. Right. I don't see women at all engaging. I'm seeing this difference between what I'm witnessing in, in West Africa, Muslims and what I'm witnessing in Saudi Arabia. So it's like in and this is all within, you know, my first year, year and a half of converting. So, you know, I moved back after Ghana. I went to New York, went to grad school. And um, and and so I'm already seeing that. Islam is not one thing. And I'm, I'm talking to people and some people are saying stuff that I'm like, oh, I don't know if I agree with that perspective. And I'm talking to some people and they're like, oh, you know, different. I'm like, oh, yeah, that resonates with me. And um, 
And I, I'm, I sort of found my home, I think my spiritual home here in the United States when I was in New York with um, a particular sort of you know Muslim community that that came the, really the African American Muslim community that came out of that um, the experience of you know moving from the nation of Islam to after Elijah Muhammad died his son took over and and that community you know went into Islam proper and and actually my wife you know came from that experience and it was really that community where I think I got solidified in my identity. And one of the key things about that experience or that association of Muslim Americans is that they had a very strong, really clear sense that you can be Muslim and American and there's no contradiction. Mm -hmm. And that Muslims in America should have embraced their citizenship. Like that was, you know, Imam Warthin Muhammad, W.D. Muhammad, Elijah Muhammad's son, you know, did a 180 when the nation of, you know, from the nation of Islam, the nation of Islam, as you know, right, was very racially focused, black supremacy, new for self, like some things which were very good. Malcolm came through that tradition, but the, um, the ideology was not Islamic, you know, it was not really Islamic. And, and um, Elijah Muhammad's son, took the community sort of after Elijah Muhammad's death into, you know, your mainstream uh, Islam proper, but then also dismantled this idea of like, America is the enemy, America's going to fall. It was more like, look, it's the seventies. This was the seventies. And it was like, look, America has changed from the, from, from Jim Crow. Um, if we're going to do something, we're African-Americans, we're Muslim. You know, the constitution is in line with the principles of, of our religion. We should work for it. And that contrasted with what you would hear often from like the nation of Islam, which at the time, you know, when I was coming up in the nineties, you know, you're hearing Farrakhan, you're hearing something very different. Here's this other alternative that's really practicing the religion, but not getting the airtime, <laughs> um, you know, not getting the headlines. Cause it's, you know, the, the people aren't saying crazy things. Mm -hmm. And I kind of, uh, not kind of, I, I found that as my home. I found, you know, I found teachers amongst that community who helped me grow as a Muslim. And so this is like late 90s, 2000, you know, I, get, I got married in 2000, uh, moving to DC. And, um, and, uh, and so, so here's the, let me, I guess, how did the CIA happen? This is, this is, this is, this is exactly uh, what happened. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Can I, can I interrupt for one moment? Um, <laughs> Absolutely. No, you're, this no, is, I this know is, I'm going on. This is fascinating. No, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to pick up right back there. Yeah. I, I'm sorry yeah. to interrupt. I just got to okay. do this. Uh, ad read real quick uh so the second sponsor for tonight's show is hello fresh uh with hello fresh uh you get farm fresh pre-portioned ingredients and seasonal recipes delivered right to your doorstep skip trips to the grocery store and count on hello fresh to make home cooking easy fun and affordable that's why it's america's number one meal kit uh you know if you have a crazy schedule it can make it easy to fall back uh, into your dinner time recipe rut. Keep mealtime exciting with over 40 recipes to choose from every week. So there's always something delicious to discover with HelloFresh. With so many in-season ingredients, you'll taste all the freshness of fall in every bite of HelloFresh's chef curated or crafted recipes. Um, produce travels from the farm to your door for peak ripeness you can taste. So uh, go to HelloFresh.com slash 50TeamHouse and use the code 50TeamHouse for 50% off plus free shipping. Uh, that's go to HelloFresh.com slash 50TeamHouse and use the code 50TeamHouse to get 50% off plus free shipping uh, on your order. So please check them out. We uh, have gotten shipments of them here ourselves on the Team House. We enjoy it. I hope you guys will go and check out the sponsor of the show. So, Jason, do you have something? Yeah, so I just need to <laughs> jump in here. This whole time I was thinking that this is amazing to me because n normally on the podcast that I've listened to, that I've been on, things like that, um, when you get an origin story, it's usually came up in the military or came up as a military yeah. person. Um, I, I joined the CIA or, you know, whatever it is because of 9-11 or because my mm. father was this or that. So this origin yeah. story is amazing to me and I, I i think it's really incredible because um you were de you were like the definition of a crossroads you were at that yeah. fork in the road you could have gone either way and i'm not saying the other way would have been radical islam or anything like that but it could have been you know what i'm not going to serve a country that doesn't serve me or my, you know my yeah. people or a kind of thing and yeah. you recognize that that is a thing you know in society yep. but you decided on a different path and that's that's pretty awesome so i'm i'm wow. loving this 
Wow. Okay. Well, so yeah, let, well that, 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 so maybe I can sort of dive into like the nuts and bolts of, of how it happened. And, and, and I'll back up a little bit cause I want to really bring things full circle because part of this to me is like, wow. I mean, you don't really know, you know, your life, you're just some, some, some things seem like chance. Some things seem like it's like, wow, you, you feel that this is destined. Um, but so let me go a little bit back to high school in this, this, the spiritual religious side again, and then I'll jump to like how I got into the CIA, because this is to me is, is interesting because a lot of people think they hear my name and they think, oh, you're Muslim because, you know, is, is it because your dad's side because of, you know, uh, your West African and uh, parentage? And I'm like, actually, no, it, it actually it, it that was not a, that was not what influenced me. And it's interesting. What happened was, again, I won't get too much into family details, but. Um, it so happened that um, a rel my grandfather, my maternal grandfather, um, had had he had joined the Nation of Islam. I think probably in the '60s it must have been. Um, you know, I never got to meet him because you know he he and my grandmother were divorced, and so my 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 mom was raised in mostly raised in, in Los Angeles, and so but my mom went to his funeral when I was in high school, so this is like 91, goes to the funeral and it's a Muslim funeral. And so um, my mom meets some family members there who she hadn't seen maybe in decades. And they give her a, a, a copy of the Quran and this other religious book called the sayings of Muhammad, which just had some, some, some basic sayings, very well, an old book actually that had a foreword by Mahatma Gandhi in this, in this book. It was really interesting. Um, and so she comes back and this is like 91, I'm in high school and she gives me those books and she gives me the Quran and that, that other small book. And, and she's, you know, she just gives it to me. She's like, okay, you know, you just, you know, you, you hold this, you know, you, you take care of it. Um, and so I was like, oh, okay. Now, cause I'm not, again, I'm not really thinking about religion at this time. I'm thinking more about culture and hip hop and all these other things, Afrocentricity, all of that. And um, so, but I keep it on my shelf. And so, I go to college and again, the book is on my shelf. And it's just so interesting because it just shows how, you know, you have to go through your own journey and how certain things resonate at certain times because of where you are. Because I remember during my sort of, you know, college time, you know, maybe I open it up the book and read some things a little bit. I'm like, okay, yeah, that's interesting. And go to on to something else. But it was, it was later on after I guess I had gone through my own journey um, and I'll never forget when I felt sort of spiritually, I was at this really interesting place, which was I had been, gone to Zimbabwe for about six weeks. And um, and this is in the 90s. And I just remember being so reflective about the order of the universe. You know, it was like, you know, it was like the, the universe has so much order, like, the, 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 you know, the cosmos, the skies, you know, the plants, the insects, like everything is so ordered. It seems so ordered. And, and, and my sort of logical leap was, yeah there must be some order for the human being. There must be some, you know, there must be some truth, you know? Mm -hmm. And so, so I'm in a different place by the time I graduate and thinking about these big, these big issues and these big ideas. And so, and it was, it was then that I kind of went back to the book and started looking and reading and then, and then I was at a different place. And so for me, again, it was like, it just became so clear, like, Oh, wow, this is, this is, this is where I should, I should go. And so, so all this, you know, so then you few years go by, I go to grad school and I'm young. I mean, I realized that like, you know, Deep. I went to grad school. Yeah, I I'm I, I didn't, um, you know, I realized when I'm in grad school that I didn't have much work experience. You know, I, I basically just, you know, spent a year abroad and now I come back in grad school and I went to international affairs and I realized that I was not um, really very uh, excited about my degree, you know, and I actually was thinking about education. Here goes that education piece to me. And so I was thinking about, you know what, I'm going to graduate here, but I think I should go into education. So I graduate and I don't get a job in international affairs right away. So this is going to lead to the, to the CIA. In fact, I have, and I get married, my wife and I get married, we move to DC. My first job, again, I have all this travel experience, all of this stuff I've done, um, an international affairs degree with the finance concentration. My first job is I become a budget analyst for the DC public school system, right, right, right here in DC. And I do that. And because I've, to me, it was like a nice balance. I, I use a little bit of my e-finance and then I'm like getting close to education. And then this is the early 2000s. This is before 9-11. So then like 2000, 2001, 
um, I decide to teach at a charter school in DC, Northeast DC. So I'm on this kick where I'm just like, you know what? Even though I did all that that education, that uh, master's, I think education is my thing, or at least let me get some teaching experience. So I so I, I decide to teach and they they I go for the interview. I say, you know what? I think I should teach econ or something. And they're like, what? No, you took calculus in college, right? I'm like, yeah, I took calculus. I mean, you know, you're our math teacher. <laughs> you're going to be teaching math. I'm like, oh, OK. All right. Let me brush. Let me brush off those those math books. So I become a math teacher and in D.C. And I'm thinking, you know what? Maybe I could become a principal, assistant principal. That was my vision for myself. I really thought I was going to go into educational administration. Let me tell you, after about a month teaching, I realized, I felt like, man, no, this is the toughest job. I don't think I want to become an administrator. I was like, this is, this, to this day, out of all the jobs I've had, teaching, that teaching experience, and I taught for three years. So I, I stayed with it for three full years. Um, much of it I loved, but it was the toughest job that I have ever had. And that's counting the CIA, this anything else, the most, the most stressful job. And, you know, I hate to say it because, you know, most people like to give that message like, oh, I taught and, you know, I was doing all these great things. And it was I mean, it, yeah, there was so much good, but I didn't want to stay there. I did not want to stay teaching. So I actually started to think, what can I do? Maybe I should get back into foreign policy, <laughs> maybe something, something like that. So this is 2003. Basically, I'm looking for a new job. I'm in D.C. I'm meeting, you know, I'm thinking about the State Department. I'm thinking about, you know, just a whole bunch of different things. And so lo and behold, in around 2003 to 2004, I, um, I'm taking the, the foreign service exam. I'm thinking maybe I'll become a foreign service officer. And um, I actually did, you know, I passed the written. And then I remember um, I did the oral and actually I missed it like by, by a little bit. So I didn't get in. And so my wife at the time was doing a PhD at Howard University. And again, my, my wife just, you know, background like, She's a Muslim, you know, African-American Muslim, came through that experience. You know, she's, you know, a scholar in her own right. She's a historian. She's a his, it was a history uh, PhD. And I'm hanging out on Howard's campus because I would always, I would go there to, you know, to meet her or something. And Howard has this Ralph Bunch Center, which is like an international affair. So I'm, I'm, I'm talking to the people at the Ralph Bunch Center because they have a diplomat in residence. And the diplomat in residence at very different campuses is always a State Department Foreign Service officer with a lot of experience who spends, I guess, maybe like a year or two at a college campus and then helps the students with um, preparing for the Foreign Service exam, giving them advice, you know, doing programs, et cetera. Now, I wasn't a Howard student, but I was going to the Ralph Bunch Center. I was like talking to him. And I'll never forget this, uh, this guy. He was an ambassador. If he's still out there, Nick, Nick Williams. I sh I've never I should actually probably reach out to him because he he changed my life. So I had, I didn't make that first, you know, the first try at, at the foreign service. So I'm in his office talking to him, you know, I'm trying to you know, get his ideas, tips on, you know, what to do next time to make sure I, I pass the, the oral exam, et cetera. And, um, you know, we're finishing up our conversation and he, and he, you know, he's telling me, he's saying, you know what, you know, yeah, yeah, you shouldn't just focus on foreign service, you know, with your background, you should maybe think about commerce or, or um, the treasury department, you know, you've got an econ background and I'm mulling it over. I'm like, okay, you know, that sounds good. I'll, I'll try to, you know, broaden my horizons, think about, you know, look at some, you know, look at USA jobs, et cetera. And, um, and then I'm about to leave, about to walk out. And then he, he says, oh, wait a second. And he ruffles around his desk and then he pulls out a card and he says to me, you know, have you ever considered working for the CIA? And this was the crossroads moment. This was the cross, <laughs> right? When he said that, well, have you ever considered? And and you know the you know the context was he had just been visited by a recruiter from the CIA. You know they had gone to Howard and probably you know you know um, passed out their cards and stuff. So he had this recruiter's card. And he was like, "Have you ever considered that?" And then I kind of paused and I was like. In my mind, it was like, you know, no, I've never considered working for the CIA. We hadn't really been thinking about intelligence. I mean, I was, I, I guess I was thinking about national security in terms of foreign service, but I never really thought about intel. Um, and, uh, and he said this famous line, which I've quoted many times. He said, and Nick Williams is African-American. And he says, you know, maybe because I had paused and I was mulling it over. And he was like, oh, you know, I know a lot of brothers working for the CIA. It's not your father's CIA anymore, <laughs> you know, and, and that, that just kind of broke the ice. And it was funny because had, you know, obviously if, if that question had been asked maybe seven years earlier, right, when I was in high school, right, I would be like, oh, no, I'm not working at the CIA. 
But I had gone through so, so much, I think, my own sort of personal maturity, seeing America differently, even by the, by this time, right? I, I had been a Muslim for, for several years. I had, you know, was had embraced my American identity. Now, I hadn't been, I wasn't thinking about Intel, but I was at a place where I was like, you know what? I, I hadn't considered working with the CIA. I told him, but but I'm open. You know, because I, I just didn't know about the intel world. It was something that I didn't know anyone in, in intelligence. And the, the sort of funny thing is, you know, I went to, I got my master's in New York City in 2000. And I always tell people it's funny because in my international affairs program in 2000, security was not a big concentration. Most people were doing like finance or econ or, you know, or maybe they had a regional concentration, but like security policy was not big. In 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 2000 it wasn't obviously until later where people are starting to you know t- you know focus on counterterrorism and security became like the concentration. So I said you know I'm I'm open to it and so I called the rec- you know I had the recruiter's card so I, I either called her or emailed her I think I called her and we had a conversation and she was recruiting for the DI for the Directorate of Intelligence uh, as it was known at the time and um, so she and I talked to her and she described the the life of a cia analyst and and it's funny she just she said something about it you know it's like it's like grad school but you're getting paid in terms of you know like you really get, you know what i mean yeah. you know that was her take it was like you know you get so much into it and you're yeah. you're working on things that are in the head you know that are important that are in the headlines and it was very intriguing to me and i said you know what i should i should check this out now this is like two, i guess it must have been late 2003 because i was about to go into my last year of teaching you know, because I was I was doing this while I was, you know, teaching still. Right. So I was like, I'm looking for a job, but, you know, I'm still teaching. And so this would have been uh, fall of 2003. And then um, and then, you know, I, you know I, I went through it. And, and at that time, it was a very simple process. Like back then, at, back then they had the interviews were at headquarters. Like it wasn't at a different building. Like I drove up and this was before like a GPS. I remember I had my map quest and I remember I drove to the agency headquarters and I drive accidentally to the employee side. <laughs> so I'm so I'm greeted, you know, so here I'm driving up, you know, for my interview. I'm going for my interview to the employee side. And of course, you know, the 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 dispose, you know, the, the security officer was like, okay, um, I think you you need to go around. Uh and so so that was my first. But I, I interviewed, um, I interviewed for a couple of different offices, and then um I got accepted to or I, I got hired for 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 Africa as an economic analyst. So I, I EOD, my entrance on duty was 2005. And so, you know, I had learned much. And I remember going back, you know, so for me, and we had talked about 9-11 because 9-11, so I have two different, so it's funny, 9-11 was one experience. I wasn't in government, I was teaching. In fact, I, I remember 9-11, I was in front of my students when yeah. it happened here in DC, um, you know, when 9-11 happened. So I had a different experience because I was really dealing with my students. But um when I when I got when I got to the agency, uh, you know, I'm I'm working as an economic analyst and uh, with a with a focus really on corruption and energy, energy issues. So I'm focused on those issues in Africa. And it was like it was like a new world. You know, it was something that I had not. Um, I mean, it's the Intel world is such a it's a, like a it's funny. It's like Intel is like a vast world, but it's a bubble. It's mm-hmm. it's a bubble, but it's it's vast because. You know, once you're in Intel, there's just so many places you can go, right? So many different, I mean, within the agency and, and outside of it. And um, so so 2005, I, I start, I'm doing, you know, regular analyst stuff, going through the training, going through the career analyst program and all of that. And so here's a, another, not crossroads moment, but a milestone for me. So I'm I'm in the agency. I'm, I'm enjoying it. I, I really you know, I, you know, the work, you know, even, even when I started, I mean, I, I, I really enjoyed it, learning the trade craft, writing, briefing, um, you know, it's just, it was just a great experience. And so when I was going through my training, uh, it happened to be, uh, to the date of July 7, 2005. And I'll never forget that day. So that day sticks out in, in, in a, in a different way for me than 9-11, because I was working at the agency at this time. And so, I remember that day because I drove to the training and drove all the way to, you know, to rest in where my training was. And um, I remember because I hadn't listened to the radio at all. I must have listened, you know, music or something or CD or whatever. And so I remember getting getting there and then the TVs are all on and I'm like, oh, what's going on? And so 
you know, you see in like on the news, it's like there was just this bombing in London, the underground, these buses, and it just happens. It's on everywhere, right? And everybody's just looking at it. And I'm like, oh man, you know, of course we kind of like, you know, just pause and everybody's just trying to figure out what's going on. And people, you know, people from CTC are like, you know, talking to their offices, you know, cause this, you know, everyone, you're just kind of away from your desk for, for, for this, this training period. And I had had two friends that I had made at the agency that were in CTC, that were in the counterterrorism center, that were analysts. And I'll never forget them. I mean, they're still friends to this day. One, interestingly, was a Pakistani American woman um, who has her own interesting story herself. I'll let her, you know, maybe she could come on. She has a real interesting background, but this, this friend, she was an analyst and she was, you know, she was in CTC and we had met and she would often say, yeah, yeah, you should, you should um, consider coming to over to us, coming, you know, doing CT work. And I, I was like, you know, what? I don't know. I'm good where I, I like this stuff, what I'm doing. I mean, I don't know much about like terrorism. I've never studied terrorist groups. I mean, you know, um, but, and, and another friend, there was another friend too, who had, there was another colleague who was from New York who, who, who worked on wall street and then joined the CIA after, after the attacks. I mean, she lost, she lost people close to her in those attacks. And then she, she joined the CIA and she was an African-American woman, just, you know, just, just by chance. And so we would often talk, you know, they would say, oh, you should think about CT work. And of course, you know, they knew I was Muslim, right? So obviously when I, you know, when I go to the agency, like that's no secret. I'm, I'm, you know, I probably should say this, you know, just for context, I'm a practicing Muslim. Um, you know, I, I pray, I pray, you know, and, and, you know, do what I can to sort of live, live my faith. And, um, you know, so I'm not hiding that I'm Muslim or anything like that, even though I'm working at the CIA. I mean, I, in my mind, I'm like, Hey, I mean, there's, I don't see a contradiction here. You know? Yeah. I went through the, the background check was, you know, was a, it was an interesting process, you know, with, you know, questions, you know, you know, Hey, it, it, I won't say, you know, but you know, I mean, they, you know, they, they get to the root of a lot of things. They 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 go deep, and um. But I, you know, I went through that process, and so again, wasn't wasn't hiding it or anything. That that was just my life. Um. But so when we learned about the seven seven bombers, when we started to find out like what had happened and who they were, that the that those bombers were British uh, citizens for the most part, born and raised. You know, uh, you know, and one of them was a convert. You know, the one that I think was like born in Jamaica or Jamaican. Uh, uh, ancestry. And so this was different than 9-11 in a big way, if you think about it, right? 9-11, we were attacked by foreigners, right? You know, the hijackers, they weren't Americans. And so 7-7 was an attack. And I actually have family in London, you know, and that was one of the reasons why I think I was thinking a lot about it. I have family that's on my dad's side that's in London. I've been to London. And that attack, right, this was Al-Qaeda using Brits, and so, you know, so I'm thinking about like my friends who had told me, oh, you know, you should maybe join the CT fight. I'm like, oh, I don't really know much about CT. It was that that made, I started to think, I was like, you know what? I understand that profile a bit, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. I understand a, a Western young, Mus young Muslim, these guys were like probably in their 20s, you know, 20s or early 30s, probably 20s. And I was in my, my 30s, early 30s. And, and I started to think about one, what can I do to, to help stop these types of attacks, especially with my understanding, right? Because for me, it's like, I understand that profile and I can understand, or maybe I have a sense of like, what, 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 what's, what's pinging them or like what their, you know, what their orientation is. And so I, I at that moment, um, I didn't, I didn't up and change. I, I, you know, I completed my training. I went back to my office and I continued doing what I was, what I was doing, but the, the seed was planted that, you know, I started to explore opportunities in CT. I mean, everyone does it, right? You're thinking about what office you might go to. And so by 2000, late 2006, um, the opportunity that sort of came to me, cause I was looking at different possibilities was, uh, doing, a, doing basically jumping, staying CIA, but then going over to the national counterterrorism center, NCTC, which was still pretty new back then. Right. And NCTC is like, you know, the place people don't, you get volunteered to go there. Right. If you're in you know, your agency, like people, you know, especially back then people talk bad about NCTC. Um, yeah. Cause you know, at all the, at all our agencies, right. Everybody thinks the other agency is bad and you know, it's an interagency thing and it's duplicative and redundant. Um, but I, I, you know, I had a good opportunity and I had a good experience for the most part. 
And um, so basically I joined NCTC to work on the AQ Homeland team. Um, so looking at threats against the homeland and, and, um, so, so that was my, my journey. So I made this choice because of that. It really made me think about hmm, maybe, maybe I should do something in the CT realm. Mm -hmm. And so I was, my economic analyst status, I think technically it was always what I had, like on paper, like in my file was like economic analyst, but I was at NCTC. So I was doing CT work for the, for the bulk of that. I wasn't doing um financial like when i got into ct it wasn't terra finance it was just you know just straight up you know plotters and some external plotting and that sort of thing so that was my journey that was the that's how i how i got to the cia and how i got to doing ct work that's an amazing story um and it's such a, a, a unique story too that you don't n n normally get to hear like as you pointed out yeah. jason um so doing the CT work, um, you mentioned that you were uh, on the Homeland Threat Team at NCTC. Um, you know, as we just go through this, I, I would like to ask you, like, are there any, like, significant plots that you guys helped break up that you're, you're able to talk about? I mean, there was a lot that was happening in, in, in those days. Um, uh, there were, Yeah, there, there were a few, I think, pro but probably the thing that I was closest to that may be of most interest that 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 I, I feel comfortable talking about because I, I, I've, I've gotten it cleared. I've talked about it in other settings. Uh, um, and, and, and it kind of hits home was so, so think about this time. This is like 2007, 2008 and 2009. This was, was like my sort of like really when I, I, I was growing as a CT analyst, like really getting in there. And this was an interesting time. So threats against the homeland. Um, what, you know, what is AQ doing? Uh, you know, height of, you know, obviously Iraq war, Afghanistan war. And um, so I followed something. It, it, it's funny because I'll tell, I'll tell you about something that I got involved in, but I didn't see it to its con conclusion. Like, I mean, you all will know how it ended, but, but I wasn't there to the end. So, so 2008, I guess it was, or 2007, 2000, I forget, but around that time there was an individual who, um, was in a Yemeni prison, and your listeners will probably remember the name, and you all remember the name, Anwar Awlaki. Mm -hmm. So Awlaki had been in prison. You know, he was, a, for the audience, you know, he was a Yemeni-American uh, in Virginia, an imam, and, um, you know, interesting history. I mean, so he was an imam, and uh, he sort of, I mean, I guess the, the main story is that at some point he became very, he became radicalized and there's a lot of backstory there. I mean, he was Yemeni and, um, you know, one of the, one or two of the hijackers, I think went, did go to his, his, his mosque, et cetera. But, um, I don't think, you know, uh, you know I'm not sure that there was a, w w what the connection was or if there was a connection, but anyway, he eventually left the U S and there's articles written about him and, uh, he went back to Yemen, right. The place of his, of his family. And he went back to Yemen and then and by the, by the time he went back there, he had, you know, he had he had become radical. I mean, he was someone who after 9-11 was saying, you know, condemning the 9-11 attacks. But then he changed his tune a few years later. And so so he he got involved in some stuff, some plotting stuff. And, and the Yemenis put him in jail. So he was in a Yemeni prison. And uh, at one point he gets out. So he gets out, but he's kind of like he's been in a prison. So he's been off. He's been off the mark. He, you know, he's, he's been he's been out. He's been away for whatever it was, like a year or a year and a half or something. And so this was when I was like, this was, you know, I, I was following issues like that. And so when he gets out, he starts doing interviews. And the interesting thing was that this is all open source. And that's actually why I, I can talk, you know, talk somewhat about this. Um, he starts doing radio interviews and online interviews um, with like reporter or, you know, like uh, sites or blogs that are in, in London. And, and so he's kind of connected. So he's putting himself back on the map. And so I, so he came up on my radar and I just kind of like started following this. And, and again, this is all open source. Aulaki started a blog. Uh, I think it was like anwaraulaki.com or something like that. <laughs> And he's blogging and he's blogging. And so I'm like, so the funny thing was, so you think the Muslim American, you know, Muslim American, like uh, we know all the imams or whatever. Like I, I did not know of Awlaki at the, at the time. I was not, even though he was, so he was, 
he was well, relatively well known in the Muslim community among certain segments, especially the immigrant Muslim, because he had lots of like speeches, like benign speeches, like not radical, like even in the early 2000s, right before he kind of went the other way. So he was a well known figure, but then he gets radical, then he sort of goes to Yemen, blah, blah, blah. So but I wasn't very familiar with him. So um, what I start doing is I actually start checking out the stuff that he had written before he went to prison, his, you know, he had this one lengthy um, lecture called Constance on the Path of Jihad. And so all this stuff is available. This is like, it's on YouTube, it's all available. So, so I'm just checking out, like, what is he saying? And this is before he went to prison, like these speeches. And so I'm listening to them. And then when he's out of prison, I'm listening to these interviews that he's given. And it's pretty clear that he is setting himself up to recruit Western Muslims. And now in these interviews, he's not saying, oh, you know, I want to recruit for bombing, blah, blah, blah. But he's saying, you know, he's he's coming, he's coming out and then he's like talking about certain things, getting very more political. He's, you know, saying things about, you know, Muslims in the West. And um, so he's doing those interviews. And then his blog, his blog, he, he starts going all out. And his his blog, so this is like 2009. So I'm so basically, I mentioned this because, so like this was a, a period where it's like, man, I'm 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 right I'm I'm following this. I'm writing about this. I'm like I think in our vault, like I became like the guy who's always talking about Al Laki. The guy's always talking about Al Laki, and because I'm I'm seeing all this content that he's pushing, and um, and then I'm trying to remember. Yeah, and then at, and then at one point, um. Fort Hood happens. And I'm trying to remember if I had switched accounts. I may have switched accounts. I don't I don't remember. But um when when Fort the Fort Hood, Hood killing happens with a Nadal Malik Hassan, if you all remember, and Awlaki blogs. Awlaki's blogging. He's blogging from Yemen. And he blogs headline. And uh Nadal Malik Hassan did the right thing. And Hassan was That's allegedly his. inspired by him, right? Exactly. I'll let, so because what was happening was he was re people were reaching out to him. Yeah. He was reaching and he had his whole like, he, you know, all these speeches were basically that they were basically radicalized because a lot of the themes were because uh, he had this one thing where he would say, like, you know, don't you know, because in Islam, it's really big, like listening to your parents like that's obeying your parents, listening to your parents. That's like a, a, a high principle as, as a Muslim. So there are young people that are saying things like, my parents don't want me to go in and join, <laughs> to, to go to Afghanistan, to go to Iraq. My parents don't want me to, to support this, blah, blah, blah. So he, he understands that. And in his speeches, he's saying, no, but when it comes to this, you can, you can disobey your parents. Mm. You know, he's basically trying to recruit. He's, and he's telling them, do what you can, go wherever you can. I mean, he's all these things that we, we hear, we've heard our AQ say and, and ISIS, you know, get really about, you know, um, proficient about radicalizing people. Mm -hmm. And so, I, so um, I just mentioned that because that was a very sort of special, I think, case for me because seeing, being able to get inside really his mind and the mind of the folks he was trying to recruit. For me, that, that was like the perfect, you know, that was, that was, I was made for that. Yeah, you and, the cultural um, understanding. And the, but the way it ended, so the funny thing was that then I left. <laughs> I, I like, so he be, so he became much more known, like the the underwear bomber. By that time, so I went to a different account. I mean, you know how it is. It, yeah. you know, these things like you work on an account, then they move you and you go do something else. And I later I did go to Afghanistan for a TDY. But when the underwear bomber ha had happened, um, I wasn't working on him by then. So basically, he by the time he got super hot, you know, I was I was focused on something else. But I always bring that as just an example of, you know, yeah, that was that was the perfect case for me. And um, and I got a lot of like radicalization was something I wasn't, you know, NCTC had a radicalization branch. I was not in that branch. But because at this time, radicalization was such a, a thing that the government was trying to figure out. They were trying to figure out how do you counter it and how do you how do you think about radicalization in America? Right. Because we had had you had had a few things. You had, had Joseph Padilla and you had Adam Gadon. Right. But then like we're really thinking about like, you know, what, what do we do to make sure what can we do? Is it the government's? How does the government stop this? Or is it something that people and communities have to stop, have to stop? And so I was involved in a lot of those conversations, even between community members and 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 the U.S. government, um, just, you know, trying to grapple with that. And. If I can, I, I think I will will pause a bit, but before I will, I mean, I'll say that 
I mean, maybe I don't know if we if we should get into this, but going through that experience and seeing how we as a country grappled with radicalization, you know, d- during the time of Al Qaeda and then of course ISIS. Mm-hmm. And seeing those dynamics. And I was, again, I was part of those conversations where the thing I learned was that this is why when it comes to these dynamics, we have to be precise, precise in our language, precise in what we're talking about. Because here I am, a Muslim, you know, yeah, I don't think Al-Qaeda represents me. I love my religion and I I think these guys are wrong. Um, And I have no problem pointing that out and saying what they're doing is evil and, and, and should not be condoned. I have no problem doing that. Uh, and, and when I talk about it, I'm going to be precise about it. I'm not going to be someone who's like, oh, this Islam thing right, is just right. about murdering people. Because no, no, that's that's not that's not the case, and that's not the nuance. So so when dealing with threats, especially when we start talking about our own country, we have to be very careful and we have to be very precise because you start lumping people based on religion or based on politics. I mean, you start saying, oh, they're all terrorists. Like, whoa, it, it can get very ugly yeah. <laughs> very fast. And so, um, so that's just something I've reflected upon um, of of late. Jason, you got anything? Yeah, I, I agree with that that last part absolutely about uh, being very precise because I think also too, if we're seeing, if we go back in the the, the individual history of people who are radicalized. There obviously, again, we talk about fork in the road. There was a fork in the road. So there's a lot of things we have to take into account, such as their age, their gender. You know, like we know there are things going on. I have grown children and two of which are are daughters, my two bookends, my oldest and youngest. So Mm. even when I talk to them, when I would talk to them, I had to take into account their age. You know, they're going through their hormones. They're going through this and that. So. I have to be very precise, especially with my daughters, about the things I would say because it could push them one way or another. So you, let's just say you're going out into the community and you're talking to these younger uh, Muslim uh, uh, kids, you have to be precise because now you're, you're coming from a governed perspective. So now you have ones who may have been taught not to trust the government, just like not to trust the police or, you know, so it's like a police officer going into a neighborhood where they don't trust the police. You know, they're just seeing a badge and a blue uniform. And um, but what you have to do, and it seems that you're you're very good at it, is taking that government piece away from it while it's still in the background and saying, hey, I'm a fellow Muslim like you. This is, you know. This is my perspective on it. Now the choice is, is yours. And um, and I think that's a, a great thing that you you kept that in mind while you have your CIA hat on and your analyst hat on. You also have the Muslim hat on. And that went into everything that you did. Yeah. If, you know what? If, I will add, though, something that made me sad or, I mean, it's, so something that I wish had worked better and this kind of kind of relates to me doing the podcast. Um, so after, so obviously when you're, so there were those meetings that I had and some engagement that I had, like like I said, right, with community and, and government at, at some point. You know, just it wasn't my main job, but I was able to do things like that. Uh, but but you know, for the most part, obviously you're not talking about your work. And so um, when I was working for the government, I you know I I didn't wasn't a big profile. You know, I wasn't on LinkedIn, et cetera, et cetera, back in those days. Um, so you don't really talk about it like publicly, like like obviously in your intel, you're not talking to the press or anything like that. So when I left government uh, 2012 and then by 2015, when I'm like working in jobs which are more public, uh, like in the think tank world, I mean, that's kind of I've been in that world mostly right for the past, you know, eight years or so. Um, the thing that uh, the thing that I wish it had worked differently is that. Um, so after I left and I started to be public about my job, um, I mean, about my previous job, um, so I can now talk about it. And so now I could actually technically do more because I could be former CIA or former counterterrorism analyst and I could, you know, like maybe go and speak and, you know, do things like that and go to college campuses and the like. And I had another friend, um, who was an ODNI, who was an analyst as well, who was a counterterrorism analyst, who actually similar background uh, uh, to me, and I can introduce you to him, a friend, Muhammad, who's African, African-American, also worked CT and, um, and, and Muslim. And it's funny because 
he also, you know, he did his career, then he left, and he's doing other things. And he was actually working on radicaliza- counter-radicalization um, efforts. And we decided to team up. We were like, you know what? We should, we should, you know, it would be good. We should like go out more and, you know, maybe go to like college campuses and, and, you know, even go you know, integrate, you know, in, interact with the community and like maybe just have the panels. And we did, we did a couple of these like panels where it was us, former, you know, former CT guys, Muslim, and we're talking to some people in the community and, and actually, you know, answering questions and stuff. But that was hard to do, man. It was really hard to do. Yeah. Not for us, but we wanted to do more of that. But by this time, this is like the 2015, 20, well, 2016, 2017, we're trying to do this. And unfortunately, the conversation about radicalization and terrorism had been so like became a toxic, you know, polemic, polarizing thing mm-hmm. where so many in the community were like, oh, that's counter, that's a CVE, that's counterviolent extremism, that's just the FBI trying to come and, you know, put you in jail or, you know, I mean, it became very tough. Mm. A lot of people in the community did not really want to, you would think that maybe, you know, we would be on the speaking. Nah, man, a lot of, a lot of, that. that's the thing to me that um, I was disappointed in and maybe I should try to do more, but I don't know. I think we kind of got the message that like, that was very sensitive yep. and mm-hmm. that, yeah. Unfortunately, because of certain certain views, you know, it, it, people didn't necessarily want to have. I mean, it's funny because I guess it, when we were in government, like government could sort of facilitate things. Mm-hmm. But then when it was like we were doing stuff on our own and like just reaching out and yeah. there was just there was just so much baggage yeah. about this counterterrorism stuff and this radicalization mm-hmm. stuff. And, oh, if you even just want to talk about it, you're just trying to, you know, get the FBI to yeah. come come after us. Yeah. And it, it actually became a hard conversation to have. And so that's one thing I wish, you know, there had been more, I had been able to do more of. And that was actually a question that I'd had mm. earlier in your lead up to joining the agency and er, your early years. And I was going to ask what mm. kind of, if any, pushback did you get from either family, friends, um, you know, things like that? Um, did you have yeah. those who said, why would you even consider doing something like this? You know, remarkably, not as much as maybe some people would think. Mm. I mean, because first of all, I mean, as 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 you as you know, right? I mean, applying is not yeah. you're not broadcasting, you know, to yep. to everybody when you're applying, right? But uh, and the people who knew, like when I went through the application, were actually yeah, like my friends who knew me in college, but who knew me well and had seen my growth and were like, oh yeah, man, yeah, yeah, yeah we 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 get you. Um, so and, and again, because my, my friends were not like I mean, they, they were very understanding. And so I didn't get any 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 pushback here, even from from family, really. Um, you know, I think people were very mature and they saw what I was doing. And, and so and I guess I guess my circle wasn't wasn't it wasn't radical. you know. Yeah. Uh, so that's probably the other thing, too. But but the, but that's not to discount that. So I'm applying, then I get in and again, I'm not broadcasting it so even in the Muslim, even though I'm still like I make, you know, Friday prayers or, or whatever, you know, I'm not showing up and be like, Hey, I work for the CIA. Yeah. Right. So, yeah. so most people don't, don't know. That's, mm-hmm. that's kind of a conversation stopper at the yeah. boss. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, but, but the funny thing is, well, obviously it, it would come up sometimes. Right. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, people that you know closely mm-hmm. and, and so some people didn't know because I mean, Hey, you, you just don't need to know. It's so funny. Some people thought I was still teaching, right. They mm-hmm. had, they had lost touch and were like, Oh, are you still teaching? I'm like, no, I'm not, I'm not a teacher anymore. I'm, I'm, I'm working for the government. Yeah. Um, but, but, but what, you know, what's interesting. So I did tell some people, you know, like people close to me and, mm-hmm. you know, and the funny thing is that, well, sometimes two things happen. So one is having some interesting conversations with these friends because they had a lot of misconceptions. So here's one perfect one I'll tell you. So I remember one, so, you know, I had joined and, you know, I'm keep I'm updating, you know, I'm getting together with a friend who I hadn't seen maybe in a few months. And I'm like, oh, you know me, yeah, so, you know, I've got this new job. I'm, I'm working such and such, blah, blah, blah. And this one friend, so he was kind of, he was like, what, really, really? And so here's the thing. This is why it was a good thing to 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 to, to talk to him. Because his big thing was, he was like, so you, you, those guys didn't really do 9-11. That, that, that was not, 9-11 oh, didn't really, that was like yeah. some inside job yeah. or something like that. I was mm-hmm. like, no, man, this stuff is real. <laughs> let, let me tell you, this, this stuff is real. This was, <laughs> this was not an inside job, yeah. you, know? Uh, you know? If it was, like a whole bunch of people are really, you know, are, 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 are really fooled. So I was able to, 
to even in talking, and this was a friend who, who you know, who was African-American, was Muslim. And so sometimes you would have conversations like that where, where you're able to talk to people about what's really going on, you know, all the conspiracy theories yep. uh, that are out there and to dispel a lot of the myths that people have. So, so that happened. But you know what the other thing that happens, especially in the D.C. area, because obviously in D.C., like what percentage of the population is has a clearance and is, <laughs> it is probably working? You know how many you know people of all stripes? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and the funny thing is, you know, in the situations where, you know, maybe I did share with people, one, you find out how many other people are working in those sorts of positions. <laughs> yeah. And then you also find out people who like you would think like, oh, man, oh, maybe CIA. But then you find people who are like. Oh man, that sounds so cool. I always kind of wanted to work there, but I yeah. didn't know who to talk yeah. to. <laughs> and you find people who are actually, uh, you know, open to it. So, uh, but you know, there may have been maybe on the, you know, on the, yeah, you know, on the fringes, some people who who found out. And, mm -hmm. But but I never, I never had had any any issue. And I actually think because, and also maybe because of who, you know, again, not to, I'm not because you know. Obviously, you change it with different jobs and, you know, I probably wasn't as as public, but, you know, I was still living my life, you know, I mean, living my life as, as a Muslim. So anyone who would interact with me would not would it's not like I was you know changing my yeah. religion or anything yeah. like that. So I think maybe that helps for, for people to see like, oh, yeah, he works for the CIA mm -hmm. and, you know, and he and he's a Muslim. So You're authentic. Um, yeah. 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 That's awesome. Thank you. And. Mm -hmm. And so then uh, after uh, NCTC, you said you went over to uh, CTC, over to the counter or CTC, the counterterrorism center. And you, you mentioned you did a, a trip over to Afghanistan. Yeah. Um, so, no. Well, the trip, I did spend some time over at CTC, but the Afghanistan TD, TDY was not specifically CTC. It was with the like Near East. I mean, technically it was the Near East. I was still at NCTC. You know how things are when you go on a rotation and you're still there and over, you know, but um, so, it, you know, I don't want to get too complicated, but I was still at NCTC. But then I did this TDY, which was through the the the, the Near East, the, the Near East South Asia yeah. analytic office. OK. Um, and so that was 2009. And so there was a lot of prep, you know, because, again, I wasn't a, an Afghanistan focused analyst. But then for that TDY, I spent some time over at NISA. Then um, and then, um, you know, it, it's funny because I was supposed to be in, in Kabul. And then I think it was the last minute, you know, a few weeks beforehand, they had changed and said I was going to go to to Kandahar. Mm -hmm. So I spent uh, 90 day TDY at the um, out in Kandahar, the Kandahar um, airfield. So I was, you know, I was there for 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 pretty much that time. Um, we have a lot of, you know, I mean, you you probably have had guests with so many more exciting stories. I st mostly you know, and maybe unfortunately I'm now I wish I had done more, but you know, I was mostly behind the, you know, stayed behind the line. Um, I didn't, it didn't go out, go out much when I was in really when I was in Kandahar. Um, but my role was I was an analyst. And so one of the key things I did was just, you know, providing that sort of, um, analytic support to senior officials, senior U S military officials that were based there, briefing them, you know, a couple of times a week. Um, and that was, I mean, so here's a here's, you know, getting to like the 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 religious side of things. So here I am in Kandahar and I'm at the airfield. And, you know, at that time, this is regional command south. This is, um, you know, you know, you know, Canadians, Dutch, you know, all, all types of folks that are stationed there. Um, and again, bringing in the religious side. So guess what? You know, I'm there. I'm Muslim. Friday prayers. I was like, oh, where's the Friday prayers? There's Friday prayers on the base. Uh, at the airfield. Um, and it was interesting because it's all like it's military personnel who, who, are, who are Muslim, American, Canadian, um, uh, plus the the staff, you know, like the people, the people, uh, people working in, in the kitchen staff and, and some of the other contractors. Yep. And we're all there. You're you're praying together Friday prayers. I remember when I when I arrived, it was a Canadian who was like Egyptian Canadian. He gave the, the sermon. So he sort of led the prayers um while he was there and you know interestingly when he left then i actually did that a couple times uh but before I, before i left like leading the friday prayers uh and so i would i could i could tell those stories and and i talked to family like like first of all they had never thought about afghanistan i'm like so here i am and it's not all that you th so it's also the afghanistan experience even my experience it's like there's a military side of it obviously i'm 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 seeing a lot of it around me 
But I'm also interacting with other agencies. I'm interacting with US, USAID, State Department. You're learning about the reconstruction that's happening in the different, you know, uh, in the different provinces. Uh, and then to tell people like, yeah, you know, I was, you know, I met there were soldiers from the UAE that were on the base at one time that I would see, um, you know, at Friday prayers. And we're all we're all together. At one point, there was a rocket. I mean, there were rocket attacks all the time. But at one there was one rocket attack um, that did that took one victim. Uh, while I was there, and it was actually a contractor who was, uh, I think he was African. Actually, he was like a, um, um, yeah, like one one of the one of the food contractors. And so, um, I guess the big. So, again, I, I I never sort of again, especially especially talking to you know you all as as veterans, um, because people say, oh wow, you spent some time in Af- Afghanistan. I'm like, man, I did a 90 day TDY. <laughs> Other people were there for a year. You know, I was this was very very brief, and but some there were some lessons for me, especially when I came back. And I know you you all are you know just familiar with that with that that feeling you come when you're in a war zone for you know even for just you know a few months and you come back. And this I came I guess it was 2009. You come back and it's just like. The world, like folks don't even know what's going on. Like yeah. we're at war and, and it's so separate from everyone's everyday experience. And I guess that's that's a good thing. Um, but I'll never forget one young analyst who got there before me was um, she told me how, you know, you know, I think I was like I had just gotten there and, you know, and most of those rocket attacks that hit the airfield, you know, they, they're just they're just trying to launch stuff and just, you know, may try to take out a plane. But usually they, they just don't they, they don't hit anything, just a little crater or whatever. She told me about how like her first week there she was on the airfield and one landed, boom, like just very close to her while they were you know getting on the plane or whatever. And um, and then just for her again, she's an analyst, right? You know, most of us analysts, we're sitting behind a desk most of the time. And I think. That's one thing about those war zone deployments, which I, I kind of wonder, I'm, I'm more removed now, which you don't have as much of, right, for for obvious reasons. Um, but that period of, you know, going into war zone and then, you know, hearing about, you know, you see, you actually are seeing a, the rocket land right near you. And it just sort of hits home. For me, it, it kind of hit home like. Okay, these guys are trying to kill me. <laughs> you know, this, this, yeah. this, this is like I mean, you know, it's not theoretical. Like this yeah. is, you yeah. know, they, they the Taliban want me dead. Yeah. You know, they want me dead. Um, and so it's things like that. I remember just sharing with people that if they didn't have that to the, the ability to talk to someone who's experienced that, who shares maybe some 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 common background, you know, it, it all seems so far away, mm-hmm. and the discussion of it is so removed, and people have their just different ideas. Um, so that, that, that really did, um, you know, that, that, that really did Im- impact me. Um, but so, yeah, I mean, those experiences, I mean, it, it, it's, it's kind of tough to, so my, I mean, let me also like, cause I'm, I'm sharing all these great experiences. Um, but you know, there were, there were some tough parts. I did have some tough parts. I mean, I, I'm, I'm painting this picture of everything was good. It's so funny. My, I, I my CIA, so it's like teaching was the toughest job I ever had, right? Tougher, tougher than CIA or NCTC or anything like that. Uh, but I will say that the time being at the agency was a highlight, just career highlights in so many ways. But one of the greatest things, just a career, like, you know, I had the opportunity to brief uh, President Bush in 2008. Um, and I'll, I'll never, I'll actually never forget how, how that, how that happened. Yeah, so, tell us. So, yeah, okay. So, I mean, it's funny when I how I found out. So this is 2008. So I'm I'm going to Afghanistan in 2009. I was going to deploy in 2009. So in late 2008 um, is when I had to do my weapons training. So like Glock training and then M4 training. You know, like two separate weeks. I had yeah. two two times to to do that. And I forget which training it was. But so I'm so I'm so I'm at that location where you where you where you where you do that training. So as you know, when you're there, so I'm I'm cut off, right? I'm not. It's not like I'm checking my uh, computer. I don't have access, so I'm just there for like a week, and but sometimes and or, or yeah. Anyway, so and then so at one point, I get a message. Someone comes to the to the room to the classroom, and they hand me one of those you know pink you know while you were out slips like from the, the a secretary would have, <laughs> yeah. and um and it just says it's like yeah yeah, call the office as soon as you can. We need you to brief POTUS next week. <laughs> and, and I'm like, oh, really? Oh. So, you know, I go and I, you know, I found, I go to whatever the admin and, and I call. And um, 
so this is so what am I doing? I'm about to, so I'm still at NCTC and I'm still working AQ Homeland threats, even though I'm about to do this TDY. And so this was it was going to be uh, President Bush's, I guess, like his farewell visit to NCTC because he's lame. He lame duck. It's late 2008. Um, I guess yeah, it must have been after the election probably. Um, and so so he's going to have like one final visit. And so they um, so they they basically ask a few analysts to you know brief him on like their portfolios. And so I was going to brief him on, you know, threats to the homeland, like the particular things that I was following. And so so um, so it's funny. So like here I am at the training and I'm like, oh, man, it's it's next week. So I didn't really have t- I mean, I couldn't prepare while I was at the training. And um, and then like the next week. So here's here's. It's just so funny. Like stories like this, I totally forgot about this until until bringing up the story. So, um, so let me tell you about the day that I briefed President yeah. Bush. So this, so I didn't go to the White House. He's coming to NCTC, right? And you, all, when you're an analyst, you actually you hate when like these when like the president or vice president comes to out to these buildings because it's like everything's on lockdown. <laughs> Disrupts you know, everything. it's like yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's like you can't go anywhere. You know, they block every. You can't go to the bathroom for like two hours or whatever. So usually you, you you hate it, but so um, interestingly, this uh, the date of him coming was actually one of the Islamic holidays, the Eid, one of the Eid holidays, Eid al-Adha, which is one of the two main Islamic holidays. So so funny, I went to the Eid in the morning. So I'm wearing my suit before I go to work. I go to the Eid prayer, and then then I go straight to work. And so it was just nice, to like a Muslim African American CIA officer moment. So I go to um, so I go to I go to to work and then, um, you know, it's there's plenty of time. And then, um, you know, when he comes, I wonder if I should share this. I mean, it's come well, on too come late on. now. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> so so this is so this is I'm, I am going to share this. It's, it's it's kind of well, it was funny back then and it's still funny now. But now it would be like now it would be taken out of context. So I'm, I'm going to tell you I'm going to tell you the, the funny story. So anyway. Um, so we're waiting till there's like, I don't know how many of us, you know, five or so analysts and of course, like, you know, a few managers. And so anyway, President Bush comes in and, you know, sits down, it's a little bit of chit chat, you know, all the little, you know, back and forth with, you know, all the, the high level people, blah, 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 welcoming him. And then, you know, they, they say they're going to hand it over to the analysts to, you know, basically, you know, brief him just real briefly, you know, like, you know, just a, a few minutes or something and then take some questions. So so one one person comes and they do their briefing and, you know, blah, blah, blah. And, and the, the cool thing, I mean, you know, President Bush was very down to earth, you know, as mo- mo- many people may not know, or very, very down to earth. So he once you get up, he asks questions. I remember this one analyst. She was uh, from Texas originally. So, you know, he's talking about <laughs> Texas and stuff. And um uh, and so when I get up, so I get up and uh, and they introduce, oh, this is Yaya Fanusi. And I think he said something like, Yaya, what? Or something like that. <laughs> um, you know, and I'm like, yeah, Yaya Fanusi. He's like, oh, where are you from? I'm like, oh, I'm from California. You know, my father's originally from Sierra Leone, blah, blah, blah. So I, I brief him, I do my thing. Um, he um he, you know, then he asked a couple questions, you know, and and uh I remember one question was a was a tough question too, but he has he asked a couple questions and you know, and um it was good. And then he uh, his ending, he, he was very like I say, Bush was down to earth. So basically, after I finished, he said he said something like he was like, good job, brother. It was it was total Bush. It was total Bush. He, 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 good job, brother. Uh, but it was it was all in a good way. It was a very like. Like I said, today it might have been kind of out of contest. Like but back then, it was like that was, that was it was it was cool. It was it, people didn't know what to say that he said that to me. I mean, it was kind of funny, but it was it was it was an interesting moment. We, uh, it was a good we moment. had a Secret Service agent on here one time who uh, protected uh, W, and uh, he said he'd, he'd seen the president like slap Secret Service agents on the ass and got give him like a good game. You yeah. know, was, yeah, that he, he's very 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 much like that. Yeah, 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 yeah. So that that was man, that that was a highlight, you know, um, you know, a, a highlight of my career. I never got to brief President Bush. I mean, President Obama, but I did brief his cabinet. Um, like especially during the, tra- the transition time, like the people who later on, um, you know, would become, you know, you know, like John Brennan and Susan Rice and mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. stuff like that. Um, but uh, but yeah, those those were those were highlights. Mm-hmm. I mean, really great experience. And even that time at NCTC, like I mentioned, a lot of people talk back then talk bad about NCTC. But here's the thing that I that I enjoyed. 
every agency and the CIA folks, DIA folks, FBI folks, everybody, DOD, I'm sure everybody knows this, right? Everybody thinks their agency is the best and they hate the other agencies and they think, oh, you know, they don't know what they're talking about, blah, blah, blah. And especially the analysts, there's always that going on, you know, when you're coordinating on papers and, and um, oh, the FBI, they don't know what they're talking about. And they're probably saying the same stuff about the CIA. And um, so it, so there's a, there's a culture. Every agency has its culture. The, the cool thing about NCTC that I found, because when I was at, you know, like headquarters, like headquarters is headquarters, as you know, right? Like it's very, it's, it's, it is what it is. And then I'm going over to, you know, LX, different location, NCTC. And because at that time, one agency can't dominate. So when I went over to NCTC, I was working like everybody around me, FBI, FBI guy. DIA, DIA, DHS, NSA, like we're all on the same team. We're like literally all on the same team. And for me, that was refreshing because it, it kind of, every time I would go back to headquarters, it's like, oh yeah, everybody just kind of like, they kind of think they're the the stuff, you know, especially in the DI, you know, DI folks at that, I don't know how it is now, but one thing I would say, you know, just being, I just got to be honest, I found that in the DI, people often take the, take themselves very seriously. Mm. Um, you know, at least that's that's what I saw. Mm. And so I think I I, I felt, yeah, you know, I, I didn't like that as much. And so over at NCTC, because you have all these different cultures mixing, agency cultures mixing, you get to me it was just a more fluid. It was more I don't know. It was more more of a, a less constrained constraining environment. Mm. Um, so so yeah, I I enjoyed I enjoyed my time. And there was at one point, even in the C, on the CT mission, where I felt like, man, this this stuff was it was very fulfilling because, you know, when I made that decision, right? Because it's funny, it all it kind of depends, like so many things. It really depends on the moment you're in and who you're around. Because you know, I, I had colleagues who like, man, they hated that place. <laughs> you know, yeah, they yeah. they yeah. did their time and then they left. Um, but I I think I had a good you know I had good supervisors for the most part and good good teammates. Uh, but uh, but yeah, there was a point in time where I was like, man, I really just enjoy this. I enjoy this job because now I don't think I think it would be it would be tough to always do CT work for like decade plus. Um, but, you know, those those few years or several years, I mean, it it was to me, I felt like I was I was tapping into something of myself serving my country, serving, you know, serving. Yeah. Serving my country, serving the people around me. Um you know, and again, tapping into my my faith, my faith tradition in, in a way where, you know, I feel I was defending my faith in many ways. And also the fact that, I mean, because again, I'm not some special person. Like there's lots of people of different faiths in, you know, in, you know, Muslim, Christian, Jewish, et cetera, the Hindu, um, you, you know, it, to, to know that you can just be who you are right, and right. work in those environments is, 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 uh, you know, is a good thing. Now, did I deal with, any issues and challenges? The answer is yes. Um, the answer is, I yeah, I did deal with some some difficulties, which actually led to me to leave. If I had to be be honest, can, can um, and tell, I know that's like tell, a whole can, can of worms. No, and, and I, I mean, what, I, I want to I want to open okay. the can of worms. Yeah, yeah. Uh, let's. Uh, <laughs> I mean, what happened? Man, I had issues. I had issues during my um, second reinvestigation clearance. Man. Um, to be bluntly honest <laughs> and, and, and put it out there, um, what were the roots? So what happened to me was, and it's so funny, you know, when people, people usually don't ask, so it's, 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 it's totally fine and good that, that you asked. And for a long time, I sort of felt like, you know, the question of why you leave the agency or, or why I left the agency, I kind of felt it was like, so, like, talking about why you got divorced mm, right in, in yeah. a sense yeah. it's like, not a happy I kind story. of you know yeah. it, well, at least you know at least years ago i kind of <clears> i kind of and 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 someone told me this is totally unrelated to like agency national security stuff um someone was talking about when you do get divorced when you find like let's say you had a whether it was a bad like let's say a bad divorce or something that you know it's a divorce so it's bad right mm. And someone said, the moment you can start talking about it and you talk, you don't talk about the partner, you talk about what you did you, about you, yeah. that's when you know you've gotten over it. Yep. So I think I, <laughs> so I think taking that, um, 
I had a challenge because I made an administrative error in something that came up during my, you know, my, my reinvestigation. And it wasn't anything that was, um, you know, at least at the time, didn't seem like it was a big deal. It wasn't anything. And it's nothing like nothing that would be interesting to like the public or to the New York Times or anything like that. Nothing like, oh, he you know leaked information. Nothing, nothing like that. Um, so so I got into a situation where I had made so an administrative error that when I discussed it and brought it up, it sort of um, brought more scrutiny. Now, I, I mean, I'll just be honest. You know, you 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 admit something that maybe you did an error, um, or that maybe maybe you weren't sure it wasn't. Maybe you weren't sure it was wrong, but then you you talk about it. And you're like, oh yeah, maybe I shouldn't have done that, and um, and it actually led to some scrutiny in my my process, and it led to um, yeah, it actually led to me um, yeah, it led led to me leaving because of the difficulty I had in that sort of reinvestigation process. And I will say, um, in sort of in hindsight, I will say that, um, like I said, I, I say from the beginning, a, a mistake that I made and why did it, why did it not turn out right? Why did, you know, why did I not stay and why didn't things sort of, you know, cause especially if it wasn't a big deal, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you know, I was young. <laughs> I wasn't that young, but I think I learned a little bit about when you're in those situations, there's a way that you can deal with them where it's like, you know, okay, boom, this happened. And, you know, I made a mistake. This is how we can fix there's it. A, there's a, this, a repudiation process, right? There's a repudiation process. And, you know, in this process, you have some ways to appeal and you have some ways to, you know, plead your case, et cetera. I mean, there's so much, man, it, it's, it, 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 I, I don't want, I won't go into the gory details because it is, it is, a, it, it is some, some disheartening stuff. Mm -hmm. But the key thing, the key takeaway, I think for me reflecting on it during that process is you can have an approach where you're like, you know, this is really wrong. And, you know, you know, you guys, you guys are doing me wrong. And like, yo, you're wrong. And I'm, you know, I'm sticking to my guns and you're wrong, you're wrong, you're wrong. And that's an approach. Um, and I think that's the approach I took in my process. And I don't think that helped me. Mm -hmm. And I think, um, I think if I had gone, used that, address, dealt with that process differently, maybe. Um, and I was more, again, I guess maybe more, I don't know, con conciliatory is not, not the word, but um i think i was a little bit too defensive in yeah, my yeah. approach and um but i mean so it, feel, it's it feels like you're it must have felt like you were under attack at that moment though yeah 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 i mean it, so that's why i say so so this is a decade this is over a decade mm. so if we had talked a decade ago man i would have been fired, I mean, up, fired up yeah, yeah. i mean this, I would have been fired up. I mean, there were so many, I, I went through so many, I mean, I, I mean, the friends who know me like this, it's so funny because there's like people who have, who stuck, who, who know what happened, you know, my family and people close to me who watched me go through that. And cause remember, this is like, I'm briefing president Bush mm -hmm. in 2008, you know, I'm going to Afghanistan. I'm doing all these things. Then I get caught up in this seemingly like just weird administrative thing. And then it turns into something bigger and it's like all this scrutiny. And it's like, and and it's you know what the, the the toughest part and this is the the part which you know I'm I'm sure those of you you, you you this is probably answering a lot of questions when you listen to the podcast yeah when you yeah. listen to the Jabari and Lincoln files like I'm basically because it's funny because there's there's so I tell people that the podcast so this the this spy thriller it is a fictional story with some realistic elements or yeah. real elements. Um, obviously episode one, for those who have listened to it, I mean, it drops you right in it. And it is the, the protagonist mm -hmm. is a CIA analyst and he is under scrutiny and he's under scrutiny for something like it's in a weird situation and he feels like he's under attack. So I, I will admit there are some realistic elements, <laughs> Yeah, but, but <laughs> obviously, right. But I mean, it's so funny because why did I write that? It's, you, that's where the story starts, but that's not where the story goes. That that's a jumping off part. It is a fictional story. It's you know, it's not it's not you know just me and, and it's not just a pseudonym for me. Yes, there's some elements that I'm drawing on, but um, uh, what I realized is like, you know, that was a decade ago. So sometimes maybe you're you're writing something and it's sort of therapeutic, and you're like, you know, 
but you can't writing shouldn't be if you're going to write a real good story and it's for the audience it can't be therapy for you so like maybe you can get a little there it starts out as therapy but i realized pretty soon that now if i'm going to tell a spy thriller it's got to be about the story about the characters um but i will say i mean because i don't want to i don't want to dismiss what what i went went through i will say that um it's so funny getting back again to things that happened because so even though things didn't work out for me and the process didn't work out in my favor um uh, and i had to you know i did other things in in in, in the intel world you know I, I basically left that and i was like i'm never working it in <laughs> i'm never going back to it I'm ne- and it's so funny because i didn't want to do anything in national security mm. what, as you can imagine, right? Yeah. Going through like the, the ups and downs. And I was like, yo, I'm not, I don't, I don't, I don't want to, I, I don't want to have anything to do with this world. Mm-hmm. Um, but with time, you know, time and distance and also seeing that, you know, I hate to be like, wow, you know, these things just end out, you know, like they should have. I mean, no one can take away that experience that I had, right? Yeah, I will always it. have that in my memory, the Absolutely. things that I did, the people that I work with, those friendships that I made, those were, you know, those, uh, you know, that can't be really taken away. And then, um, and I, it's so funny because outside the career, I've had really a second career, um, which interestingly is like, it's drawing on things that don't come from the agency, don't come from the classified world. Because when I left, so when I left, I was actually hired. So it's so funny. And, and I'm not going to name the person. Uh, if if this per- if he listens to it, he knows who he is. But there was a senior person within, um, you know, who is a senior person within the sort of U.S. national security infrastructure who um, hired me um, a- out of all of this. Right. Who hired me out of, uh, you know, when, when I, you know, when I left and I worked for um, I worked for a doing some work doing illicit finance research and financial asset recovery. Mm -hmm. And so the interesting thing is that, so I'm fresh out of the the IC, fresh out of the Intel community analyst. I'm used to like agency systems, classified stuff. And I get hired on this project where this, this, uh, this company has assembled a team and our job, our mission is to, investigate and find assets that have been stolen through kleptocracy. And this was, this was our job. It was a small team and I was, I was the analyst. And so, so I was hired, you know, and thankfully, you know, uh, from this person who, you know, I I had a relationship when I was on the inside now, you know, he hires me on the outside and I, I now have to sort of pivot because we had this job where we don't have anything classified. We're not, you know, government officials. We don't have a, you know, there's no badge and guns here, but we have to try to figure out where these assets are using open source tools. And this was like the opening for me for a new sort of a new career because I'm still, I have the, the analyst Intel mindset, but I don't, but I don't have those old tools except for that sort of open source stuff, right? I was I was really back when it wasn't big to do open source, I was doing open source, so I, I have that. And so I learned basically how you could use tools, open source tools to investigate finance, to find assets that might be hidden, to find front companies, to um, learn the typologies of money laundering, trade-based money laundering, all these different like little things that illicit actors use, I learned them out of the agency because I was doing this work, not, not, not in government. So this was my first job and it, it opened me up to like a whole new, so the illicit finance stuff that I talk about now and that I I'm mostly speaking about and writing about in articles, most of that was gained. Even though if you, if you listen to the Jabari Lincoln files, that analyst, he's a financial intelligence right, analyst. Right. So I'm sort of bridging the stuff the that I do up. you know now with the stuff, you know, at the CIA, but I wasn't doing that at the CIA. That's why it's a fictional story. And, you know, I can talk, I can make up stuff because it's not, you know, it's not stuff that I actually worked on. Um, can, when I was can, in government. Can, can you talk about any of these investigations you did trying to like, I, I guess we're talking about like government embezzlement cases and things like that. Yeah. 
and we're talking about at the time when um, you had foreign foreign corrupt governments, yeah. foreign governments that would have like money in Swiss bank accounts. So mm -hmm. you just imagine situations like when when a uh, um, like a foreign government, like let's say when they get de deposed, right? And so now people are trying to find those stolen assets, those Swiss bank accounts and those other assets and yachts and all that stuff and bring them back to, you know, hopefully to the people that they belong to. So it was doing those like international investigations and tapping into like, what are the databases that you would use? How do you learn about, um, you know, how do you learn about front companies? And, and you know, what are, what, you know, and the lesson I guess I learned is that, so the, the wonderful thing about like finance and business is because of what it is, there's a record for everything. So even if it's a false record, it's still a record. And a false record gives you a trail, a paper trail. Right. So it's all about putting those pieces together and any business transaction, there's a rec there should be a record of it. Even again, even if people even are, if it's a lie. You know, so you know, yeah, they're, they're they're trading, right? So maybe they're doing stuff with cash, but they got to send stuff from one place to another. There's going to be, you know, there's going to be documents, custom documents, etc. So I I got into this world of illicit finance as really my my second career. And I mean, were you able to recover any of this money? Uh, there, there, <laughs> uh, no, I mean, I know that it's I know it's a very tough field. I've talked to people in the past. I mean, that's extremely difficult to repatriate stolen funds. Yeah. yeah, it is. And the thing I will say is that, unfortunately, I wish we could have done more. We didn't get to. Um, so we, we cut the, 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 the contract sort of, you know, we, I, I didn't continue working on it uh, or, you know, so, um, so maybe that's all I can say, <laughs> uh, but it was a great experience for while, while it lasted. But, um, but yeah, I, I, I'm not sure what I can say. So that, 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 that's why I'm dodging. That's why I'm dodging. That so I, so I have but, to listen, I have to listen to your podcast and try to put the pieces put it together. All together. Like what yeah. you're telling put me. The pieces, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yep. Maybe so. Maybe so. Um, but yeah, but that was that, that was, so I had that experience and then, and then, so I'm, I'm learning about this other stuff. And then I get, I get, um, I get another opportunity uh, to work at a think tank, the Foundation for Defense of Democracies had uh, basically is national security think tank in DC. And they, they had stood up this thing called the Center on Sanctions and Illicit Finance. So I get hired there, I'm the director of analysis. And so here's the thing, this is like an interesting thing of, of, just pivoting and not knowing what's next because I go from that one project we were just talking about to now think tank world and think tank world is public think tank world is you write articles you talk right, to media right. and I'm kind of like it's so funny because I remember they were like so you know can we please you know so on your bio we put you know you know former CIA and I'm like no no yeah. don't, don't I don't want that on the website yeah. don't put you know you know this is like 2015 I'm just like no 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 um <laughs> Can we put it in the press release? I'm like, okay, in the press release, but don't put it on the website. Um, that lasted for about six months mm -hmm. because it took me six months to, to realize, okay, yeah, yeah, I got to get comfortable. I, I I can now talk to press. I'm, in fact, no, we want you to talk. To, we want you to talk yeah. to reporters. I was like, are you sure? So the think tank policy world, that's what it is. You have you're engaging policymakers. You're engaging media. You're doing events, and and so this is where it's like. I'm now no longer in the IC bubble. I'm I'm not in the Intel community and I probably probably can't go back because you know I've got relationships with reporters and I'm, I'm that's just my world. I, it would be and and I I like that that I'm free to, you know, to, to do all these things. Right. I don't have to worry about things I'd worry about in government. And so and 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 honestly I could be a resource and it's so funny because I can write things that could be useful for people yeah. in government because hey, I'm doing research on my own. So this is like 2015 and I'm working at the Center on Sanctions and Illicit Finance. And this is a learning curve because even though I had done this investigative work, now I'm dealing with like a different dimension, which is like more policy side of it. Things like sanctions and sanctions evasion, which I hadn't really dealt with so much. Uh, things that Treasury does. And I, again, I wasn't a Treasury analyst. So, so this is all new. And I'm like trying to find my way. So I'm, I'm actually, you know, I'm writing some papers and you know, I'm following, I'm, I'm learning about sanctions and, you know, doing some stuff on terrorist financing, writing some reports. And then I'm thinking about like in 2015, 2016, I'm learning about Bitcoin. And I had, I knew nothing about Bitcoin when I was in government. And so I learned about Bitcoin in 2015, what Bitcoin is. And, and I'm intrigued because people start saying like in the media, they're saying, 
um, there are these reports basically saying that terrorists are going to use Bitcoin or ISIS. This is like, you know, it, the big thing was like ISIS is going to use Bitcoin. And these were claims. These were reports. But I could never verify it. And again, I'm, a, I'm an old DI guy. I got to look at the sourcing. I got to, you know, I, you know I, I can't just regurgitate what people say. Right. And um, so that stuck in my head. Bitcoin. Bitcoin is an interesting thing. I wonder what there's a if there's a relation. So over the year, I'm hearing a lot about crypto and terrorists. But there's never any proof for someone who's outside of government to like see what's happening, right? I mean, I just I just don't know. So 2016, I'll never forget. Summer of 2016, and I have my these two interns, and I get a report, um, some media report, and I think it's from some some publication in the Middle East, and it basically says there's a terrorist group that is using Bitcoin, and um, this was actually it's um, actually this a, a Gaza-based group that was designated. It's not Hamas, but it's like a different this consortium of groups in there. Um, and so so I, I read the headline. I'm like, oh, yeah, this is probably just another thing where we can't verify. I, I, I hand it to my interns. And I say, hey, you know, check this out. I'm going to go to lunch and then, you know, see what you can find. I'll come back. It's probably nothing. So I come back to lunch and my uh, millennial interns, you know, or maybe Gen Z interns, um, they showed me the Twitter page of this campaign. And the Twitter page, well, of this group, they were on Twitter and they would always change accounts, you know, but they were still they always get up on Twitter and they had an infographic they posted and the infographic had a QR code and the QR code, once you scanned it, brought you to a another web page, a browser that uh, was the Bitcoin address that they were soliciting funds to. And this group was actually soliciting funds for weapons, for missiles. And they had the graphic. It was like all these different missiles. Wow. They had the distance. It could go. <laughs> yeah, it was. I mean, I, I have I have photos. That's pretty of bold. Of all that. Oh, wow. Oh, no, it was, it was exactly. I mean, man, I mean, if, if I could even show. Well, I could even show you the graphic. Like I I, I took a screenshot. I've, I've saved it for years. I even use it in presentations sometimes to show to, because this was significant because once you looked at the address on this brow on the blockchain browser, basically is what they call it. You can see what they have received. You see the content. You see how much Bitcoin is in that address. Yeah. And you can actually see like when the, the transactions were into it and when the transactions were out. And this was the first time I'm seeing anything like this. And right. so I, I took a step back. I was like, wait a second. Wait. So this is a terrorist group seeking funds. And I can see the funds they've gotten and I can like watch if any if anyone puts funds like this is this is phenomenal. This is. This is a, you know, this is great for investigation. This is wonderful for, for trying to follow them. And I was like, because you wouldn't get that in the old school banking yeah. terrorist financing where you right. have no right. public view into what they're doing, right? So this was the beginning of my exposure to blockchain analysis and crypto analysis and looking at what bad guys are doing with crypto. Because what we did was we said, okay, let's learn all we can about this address. Let's study it. Let's every day, you know, we, we made a Google Doc. Okay, let's see any new transactions. What, what, what can we know about these transactions? What can we tell? Can we figure out where they came from? Now, when you look at uh, this blockchain record, you don't see the names. You don't see who the people are, but you see the wallet addresses. But then there's things you can do to identify, like, well, where did the transactions come from? Maybe you could trace it to an, an exchange where they bought the crypto before they sent it in. And that's what we could do. And that's what we did. So this was a this became a research project over the next couple of weeks. And then I wrote an article about it, um, and this in 2016. And so I I I think I described it as this is the first publicly verifiable terrorist found terrorist fundraising campaign with crypto. Not saying it's the first time terrorists use crypto because maybe they've been using you know maybe they tried using using it before, but this was the first time where. We could, you know, we confidently could say this is the group. They have this pattern. They've been using th this Twitter account. This is them. And this is and they're posting this and this, you know, and they're receiving trans transactions. So we can publicly verify it and we can write about it. We can talk about it. No clearance needed. This is a new, this whole is new, really world. A new, yeah. new thing. Yeah, it's a whole new world. So I got into that's what I started to look at. I mean, it started looking at terrorist financing with crypto, but then. Other issues started to develop by like 2017. You have Russia 2018. Russia is sort of thinking about using crypto for sanctions evasion. At least they're talking about using it and thinking about it. It's like political. It's they don't really have the means to do that, but they're they're thinking about it. Iran similarly is thinking about how crypto could be a way for them to transact. 
without going through the banking system and to evade sanctions. So this is like, so 2018, 2019. So I kind of feel like, so in my career, I, I've always found this, um, this joy of like, I get bored if everybody is already looking at something like right, right. If, 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 if it's on the front page, like I'm not interested in it. It's like, uh, I, I, I'm very intrigued by, well, what's next? What are the, these actors going to do in, in next year, in the next five years? Yeah. You want to solve and the so, puzzle for yourself. Exactly. You know, otherwise it's like, it's, it's boring. And it's so funny because that's like the CT world, even though I started as a uh, economic analyst, when I, when I joined the CT, I was like, man, I like this so much more. <laughs> Because you're on the edge, you're, you're trying to stay a step ahead. Where with some of these other like political analysis and economic analysis, it's more like you're reacting often. I mean, you're still trying to predict, but you're kind of reacting to the data and the things that are happening. With CT, like you're trying to stay two, three, four, five steps ahead. Mm -hmm. um, but anyway, that so that was so that's where so this is like 2016, 17, 18. So I started to look at financial technology. And learning about things like blockchain technology, learning about things like digital currencies, and seeing how do how do they relate to national security, either risks, national security, comp you know, comp competition. Um, what is China doing? China is something that I've I've been looking at a lot. So I've taken so I've been out of the Intel community for uh, over a decade now, but have been able to you know, thankfully, thank God, I've been able to still follow my like interests, my analytic interests, still doing research, still doing analysis, and think about things that impact US national security uh, in a whole new realm, stuff I, I never touched on when I was in the agency. So I, like I say, I, I call it, it is a second career. And the podcast, the Jabari Lincoln Files, it's if you you know it's funny, it's like the culmination of right, all right. these parts of my life. Yeah. The CIA part, you know, the 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 financial technology part, the 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 Islamic and the spiritual part is in there. Um, you know, the fam you know, family, you know, I mean the family's not my family, but it's just like, you know, the connection to family. Right, right, right. All all these things, you know, I feel like I'm summing up into one entertaining you know, entertaining stories because maybe I'll I'll pause, but after I say this, which is being an analyst, you're writing all the time, and it's all nonfiction. It's all you know, you know, it doesn't have to be dry, but it's you know, it's it's facts and figures and assessments and all of that. And I've done that for so long. Um, what I didn't mention to you guys, I can't believe I didn't mention this. I mean, I mentioned how I was into hip hop in the back in the day, listening. But I also was a lyricist myself. I was rapping when I was in high school and college. Um, I used to freestyle. That was like my pastime, um, you know, in, in my college days. And I, I did a lot of creative writing. I did poetry. I, I wrote, you know, I did uh, poetry performance and I would write poems. And so I always had this like more artistic side. And so, but I'm spending all this time doing, you know, writing that's not artistic. And so this podcast sort of started with the idea of, bringing doing an artistic you know telling an artistic tale that could tie in all these policy things all these national security things but to do it in a way where it's fun and it's engaging and it's like a whole new world that's what that's what the podcast is yeah i was, I was going to ask you you know how the podcast came about like was this a covid project when you're locked up at home for a period of time <laughs> well jason do you have anything you want to uh ask before we well, move you, on you kind of uh answered it but i was going to ask you having been out of you know out as if we were in prison out of the IC <laughs> now for for a while yeah. um when you see these things uh happening on TV the news whatever it is from uh what's going on in the middle east to small town things when you see these things do you look at them from an analyst point of view because you have that embedded background um or do you kind of parse it out look at it from an analyst point of view from a Muslim point of view, from, you know, just you point of view, or like with me, I, because of my time, I've been out since uh, 2015. It's like, I see things and I guess having been a, you know, being a dad and having been a husband and all this other mm -hmm. stuff, I look at things from that point of view, but I also, I can't help it. I also look at yeah. it from an Intel point of view. Do you find yourself doing that? Absolutely. I, I find that, you, again, you can't take I mean, you just you just said it, Jason, you can't take the, the IC out of the man. Right. Mm -hmm. Even if you take him out of the IC, um, uh, it it's 
it, so one of the key things is probably the thing that keeps with me the most. I mean, it's, I mean, like there's that, the top level super kind of superficial, which is like, you think about maybe, you know, um, like what you would be doing if you were there, mm -hmm. there's that. But you know, for me as an analyst, the thing that sticks with me the most is actually verifying information mm -hmm. and seeing the weaknesses in like what is presented. Yep. Uh, because as, a, as, you know, as an, as an analyst, you're always dealing with, okay, what's the truth of truth of the matter? Mm -hmm. What is, what do you have confidence in? And also I remember even before the CT, I actually, I will credit my, my, my original economic analysis work because it was a lot of really, it was mostly political economy, but because you learned a lot about media mm -hmm. and how media is, especially in other countries, mm -hmm. And you would see disconnects. You would see what's really happening when and what what media is saying is happening. You would see different types of medias in different country in media in different countries and how they're not always reliable. And you would kind of get the sense of like, wow, you can't just like rely on what the news says or just what you know what a politician says. Like you kind of have to like take it all in and see what's what. Like that's as an analyst, as an intel analyst, that's what you do. Yeah. And I find that I do that on the outside that when issues come up, current events. I, I think the thing I notice, and this happened as social media got bigger, it's really worse with social media because yeah. it's like social media, I just realized it's like, man, like there's just a whole bunch of just nonsense <laughs> that people are pinging off yeah. of. And it's like people aren't really thinking critically. They're not really thinking about, they're just really going with headlines and memes. Mm -hmm. And you know, you can't do that. You can't base your understanding of something based on headlines, what people say. Absolutely. And I think there's a lot of that. So I think that's, I mean, I, you don't have to go into the Intel community to come to that conclusion, yeah. but because like you're really trained to think mm -hmm. that way, um, it, it actually gets, it gets hard. Yeah. And sometimes I feel, sometimes I feel disconnected. I mean, maybe, maybe you, you too as well, Jason, like, because you, you feel, you know, and you too, Jack, it's like, because you, you know the the dynamics like of security of national security and like you sort of you you know them you know you know how certain you know there's yeah this might be happening in the current event but there are all these other considerations yeah. and I think sometimes it makes it hard because sometimes people are just reacting to headlines mm -hmm. yeah. and um you know so I'll share I'll share one thing like this is a good example this is this is kind of raw because it's happening right now so um I'm gonna share this I haven't shared this 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 at all and it's going to get like i am not an expert on uh israeli palestinian conflict right this is never something that i that i focused on I'm, I'm 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 a layman um but so i will say something that my that my analyst my my analyst antennas are are pinging pinging up on obviously we live in very very you know just volatile times mm. just a lot of a lot of a lot of um you know, divisive times and, and the like. So so here's something I've been thinking about recently. Um, so Hamas attacks happen, attacks on Israel, you know, killing, you know, you know, murder, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then so, you know, and then, of course, Israel is responding. And in, in our in the social moment, this is becoming like a big thing on social social media. It's 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 a huge. I mean, it's it's just a huge huge thing right now. I, I, everyone watching this knows. So here's here's what what is concerning me as someone who followed CT a decade plus ago. Um, so you're hearing things or seeing things where, like, let's say protests protests are happening. And you know that when you have protests, you have all types of folks come in, right? You got some folks that are, you know, really trying to voice their concerns about the situation. They want something happen. It's, you know, they, they want to change the situation or whatever. They're voicing their complaints. And then you have ideologues who are of all who've just been waiting for something they yeah. want to pounce yeah. on. So I, I saw this one protest where there was this banner and the banner said, um, resistance is not terrorism and so but what are they saying they're basically saying hamas can do this because it's resistance and that is that's just a straight playbook with that 
terrorists have been saying that you know Al Qaeda, ISIS have been saying, all, all, well, you know, groups have been saying basically, you know, that that the, the the ends justify the means. And um, my concern is that so because I'm coming from the CT world, it's like I'm seeing that I see that dynamic. I actually see how that radicalizes some people, right? Because they're the, this geopolitical thing, they're seeing it through this 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 lens. And once you're looking at it through the lens of resistance mean you could do anything i mean that's again that can be a radical that can be a radicalizing force i'm i'm concerned it's kind of hard for me to talk about this yeah. because this is such a sensitive issue yeah, I mean, and absolutely. other dynamics i am not talking about the dynamics of the conflict i'm not talking about what needs to happen that is not my lane mm. i am talking about that there are forces out there and al-qaeda and isis have already put out they put out statements mm -hmm. saying okay boom all right this is our fight Muslims around the world, boom, you, you, you guys get started. Mm -hmm. that, that has happened. They've already put out those statements. I am not here to tell the, uh, I'm not here to sort of scare the audience and say, oh, you know, people are going to rise up and that's what's going to happen. I am saying that these are dynamics that we got to, we got to deal with. We got to check. Yeah. We got to be aware of. Mm -hmm. So, so this is, I, I know I'm getting a little heavy no, here. No, no, it's no. important for people to hear that. It. And I appreciate mm -hmm. the fact that you started it by saying, you are not an expert in the Middle East, that this is your opinion, because yes. too much of what we've seen is, whether it's YouTube or whatever, social media, on the news period, we get people yeah. who have done certain things, and I won't say, you know, uh, uh, you know, whatever they did, now they're an expert. And if people would start more by saying, I'm not an expert in this, this is the way yeah. I see it, like you just did, I think it would go a long way, and I, I appreciate that. Yeah. Yeah, opinion. You, don't you? Isn't it? It doesn't. It seem like like social media is just like an opinion factory, and that mm -hmm. everybody's trafficking in opinions. And, yeah. But they and, don't you know, count it like, as opinions. They they count well, it. Just, they don't say the word opinion, so it's fact yeah. in their mind, and there's those it, listening to them. Yeah, yeah. So that that and that's hard as 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 you know as an intel guy. It's like man, you know. Um, my, my 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 antenna is up and and i i don't i don't that's not helpful because when um so when we had the 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 radicalization you know during the height of al-qaeda and, and then isis you know in in those days it, it's funny because you know these are the arguments that they use in their propaganda yeah and so i kind of feel like we've been so removed i mean it's so funny i mean maybe it's just a cycle because you know you sort of you sort of felt like, yeah, we had to come to a place. I mean, obviously, I mean, so the jihadist movement, again, although I'm not tracking the, you know, jihadists, you know, like back like 10 years ago. So I, again, I'm not an expert on like what AQ is doing today and senior leadership, et cetera. But I know enough to, to know that the movement is still there, yeah. you know, especially in Africa. Africa is like a rising place. I do know, you know, I, I just from observation, right? Mm -hmm. You see places like Burkina Faso. You know, I was in Ghana in the 90s. Burkina Faso was like this calm, peaceful, like mm -hmm. nothing was there. Nigeria. I mean, I so I went to Nigeria. I was in northern Nigeria in the 80s, early 80s. Calm, peaceful, Muslim, Muslim North. Um, probably, probably less, you know, probably more peaceful than than the South, right? It just shows you how di how these things are changing and and evolving. And in my mind, that's a, a good sense because actually, there's there's a good part of it, which is like a lot of people because they're learning about all this stuff now. They see they see Nigeria, they see the middle, well, you know, the all these things, and they're like, oh my goodness, this is you know, but these you know these places, Nigeria has been Muslim for a long time, you know, or Burkina Faso has been Muslim for a, for a long time, you know, this this stuff is new, you know, Ivory Coast, um, you know, there have been pockets of it, but it's, but you know, if it was if it wasn't always there, that means that maybe it it it, it can go, you know, it's it's not intrinsic, it doesn't have to be, you know, have to be there, but so these things are are there, and I think um, because terror, you know, I don't know, maybe because terrorism has not been on the news as much and it's it's been taken aside you know it's it's a backseat to, to other things um you know i, I i'm i'm hoping and praying that you know we're not going to go into the, those old days but you know if i i think i think what what i'm more concerned about now is as a layman as just a regular citizen is our dialogue as we talk about these things the slogans and the terms that we use that we really have to. We really have to be careful because be precise, you know, like you said yeah. earlier. Yeah, and be precise. Yes. Yep. Yep.
goes back to uh, that. D, if we have any questions, can could you tee those up for us, please? Uh, I actually sent me messages. Oh, you. oh, you sent them to me. You, you did. Oh, can, uh, while D, you're teeing it up, yes. While you're teeing those questions up, I will answer your question, um, Jack, about because uh, I think you asked how did was it how the podcast started? Oh, like yeah, oh, yeah, was it a COVID please. project? Yeah. So so here's the funny thing, and this is this is how I changed from. A few years ago. So remember how I said a few years ago, I was, if you would ask me about my agency experience, like it would have been kind of raw for me, um, at least the, the ending of it. Well, um, so a few years ago, oh, so here's a, something maybe you all don't know. So I had an older podcast, 2015 to like oh, no, 2018 or so. Yeah. So, so my first podcast uh, is called Rhythm of Wisdom. And Rhythm of Wisdom is, it's similar, it's a storytelling podcast, but it's all true. It's actually true stories that I'm recounting. And it's, it's, it's me. I mean, it's, it's not a pseudonym. It's me talking about some of my experiences. Um, I'll send you guys the link because, you know, since the Jabari Lincoln file is, is, is waiting for season two, maybe you can catch up on the rhythm of wisdom, but, but rhythm of wisdom was my story to, I started writing it. It was just a creative outlet. And those, those episodes are available uh, today. They're still up. But what I decided at one point was I, I, I decided I, I was going to try to write a memoir, right? You know, like, you know, I, I think it's a little, now I'm looking back and I'm like, okay, yeah, that's just a little self-absorbed. But but I actually was thinking of writing a memoir and I, um, and I put together a book proposal and I talked to a couple of literary agents and, you know, typical is, you know, that you don't always get a, a, a the green light or they don't bite. Um, but I talked to a few literary agents who thought I had a good story because I had the proposal was like the first chapter and and I was going to write a book. I was going to write a memoir and it was going to be interesting. It was going to be about my life. And um, and the first like two or three literary agents that I pitched it to passed. And um, and I think that's just that's just natural. Right. You maybe got to improve the, the proposal, just not right time, whatever. And these were like, oh, this is a great story, but I just can't take it on. It's just whatever. Um and so, so it was, so it was, so I, I, so I was, that was what I wanted to do. I wanted to write basically a story that would be about my life, uh, you know, uh, a, a non-fictional account. And at some point, cause I think I got some of those, uh, well, it wasn't, the, that wasn't the, it wasn't just the literary agents. I went to this podcast event in Philly and it was this podcast conference and I pitched that I was, I pitched my um, my story. Like I, I read my story, and I was, I was. It was like a pitch competition, and and Audible was there, and I did very well, and I did very well, and you know, people were like, "Oh man, we got to talk to you. We want to, you know, maybe you could do something for Audible." Blah 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 blah. And then just one thing led to another, and it just didn't work out. Like Audible changed its thing, and just it just went nowhere. So I was frustrated. I was like, "Man, I think I got a great story. I think this should be a book," you know. And, you know, I could write this. I just need, you know, blow. I just need somebody to give me a chance, you know. And um, so it's just interesting. I don't know where it happened. But at one point I was thinking about writing the story and I was like, you know what? Writing the story is going to be hard. It's going to be tough because I'm going to have to, you know, it's your personal life. And I was just like, you know what? Why don't I just scratch that? I think I want to write a spy thriller. I think I want to make something up. And so that was the birth. It was just me like, you know, dealing with the disappointment of, you know, the book proposal didn't go right. And, and I was just like, you know what, it would be more fun. So this was in 2019. So it was before COVID. I started writing it and I thought at the time that I'd be done with it in like six months and it took like a year and a half to write. Um, and so through COVID, COVID probably helped because I wrote it through COVID and um, and then I did the production, you know, that took more time. So it, it went through several edits. So, yeah, it was a partially COVID project, but it was really like me figuring out, you know what, let me just do let me let me be creative. Let me write something fictional instead of writing about myself. And so now I'm like, even though we spent whatever, two hours talking about me and my life, because <laughs> um, honestly, I, you know, I would I prefer to be in the if I, if I could just disappear. And the character Jabari Lincoln's could be what people connect to because to me that's more fun. Like my time is done. I I had I did my 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 agency stuff. The Jabari Lincoln files is like that's I think that's the story. That's the story world that I want to live and I want to share with more people. I, yeah, and I, I hope people will go check it out. I'm halfway through the podcast series right now. Yeah. I got to finish it. 
But the, the link's right down in the description for people to go, ch- go take a look at it. And because it follows, uh, the, you know, the spy thrill or the adventure is from the point of view of a financial terrorist analyst, it has a totally different vibe than other spy thrillers. Right. Even we, we've it, it had some guests on the show even just recently. We talked to um, uh, the author of The Peacock and the Sparrow, the author of Moscow X. Good books. Gr- you know, great, great people who were uh, agency case officers and analysts. But I think the Jabari Lincoln files has like a totally different perspective yeah. because of your background. And uh, I hope people will go and check it out because they will they will get like a very different perspective on a spy thriller. Yeah. Um, Thanks. So I'm, I'm going to uh, hit up a few questions here. Uh, Eric, thank you. Uh, KX says, uh, if I'd ask your opinion of the book, The Looming, Looming Tower, and also, if you're aware of Zawahiri's KGB training, uh, that's a, that's a new one for me. But I don't, do you have a, a, an opinion? I don't. I don't know about the KGB training. Uh, that sounds sounds interesting. Was that bef- like before he was in prison? I I, I, I would assume. I guess. I don't know. Because uh, it sounds like something that could have happened in the '70s. But no, I, I've never heard about it. And the Looming Tower. I never read it. I remember when it came out. Because I think it came out like maybe before I got into CT. I think that's like early to like mid 2000s. Um, but I, I don't think I actually read Looming Looming Tower, but um, but I do. Was it was it, who? Well, I guess the person can. I don't. I forget who it's by, but is it Peter Bergen or, or somebody? But I never I never read it. So okay, and and it's kind of funny because when when you're doing CT, like you don't you don't read a lot of the open source stuff. Yeah. At least I didn't read a you know like l- l- some book. I read more before I went into CT than uh, while I was doing CT. Yeah. Um, Sierra star says, congratulations on your success and achievements. Thanks for sharing your story. Uh, then Isaac asks, uh, I read tracers in the dark on how the IRS and a private company found criminals by tracing crypto purchases and wallets. So is there any way for people to make private purchases online and in real life? Also, besides living off the grid, how can someone gain privacy and anonymity? Like for a spy in China or a corporate whistleblower in America or someone hiding from a violent ex, uh, what should they get for communicating and for staying invisible in real life or online? Uh, and uh, should they structure or evolve their OPSEC? Uh, what should they do for researching, staying up to date? So I, I guess the, the, the thrust yeah. of this question is about privacy and, and what can the average yeah. person do to, to keep their communications private? Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm probably not the, I don't have a good answer except to say that the, this, the viewer listener, you're right on the money with something that a lot of people are, are trying to do. Um, so there, there probably, I'm sure there probably been other guests who probably can talk more about the OPSEC, right? Like certain, certain apps, messaging apps, encrypted apps are better than others. You know, a lot of people talk about signal um, that, you know, uh, but again, I'm not, I'm not, the, I'm not the expert in terms of, what's going to be the best trade craft. Now you started talking about crypto. And so there's two sides to this story of like tracers of the dark is, is a book. I actually have met the, that I've talked to that author. Um, and, and I, I, I recommend that book because that story talks about how IRS criminal investigations went after, uh, these illicit actors that were doing stuff with crypto. They traced those crypto transactions. Um, there's a double edged sword on this because, Privacy is something that we need. I actually think because I've done a lot of research on China and what China is doing with its economy is becoming more digital and it's come up with a digital currency, which is going to be really provide data to the government. So I'm seeing this happening in China. You're seeing this development and crypto, you know, because it doesn't belong to it's not it belong, doesn't belong to anyone. You know, it, it offers a way for you to have your money in a way that somebody can't necessarily take if you have it in in a certain way um i i the caution that i have though is that you have to be careful because who else exploits i mean you obviously the bad guys are trying to exploit the privacy too and privacy tools you have tools that have been used which are just for preserving privacy like privacy mixers and crypto um one thing that happened recently there's this really one that became very popular called tornado cash and um it got a lot of liquidity people were using it to make their transactions private at one point guess who also wanted to make their transactions private north korea Mm -hmm. and north korea started exploiting this tornado cash mixer 
Um, so much so that U.S. Treasury came down and sanctioned the mixer itself. Oh, wow. Yeah, they put a put a, put a sanction <laughs> uh, designation on the mixer. This was something that has never before happened because the mixer itself is really just it's not a person. It's a program. Right. You know, it, right. uh, you know, it's smart contracts. Um, now there's some there's some nuance there because DOJ is going after the the guys who 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 were behind it and and I probably shouldn't get into that but it's more complicated but I guess the moral of the story is that this is ag- the 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 guest you're you're actually on the pulse of something that I think is actually going to be a, a critical question for our society because there should be privacy right we should not have to live in a way where all of your data goes to the government the fourth amendment we have the fourth amendment for a reason you know, uh, there should not be search and seizure, you know, by the government. And so if we're going more digital and your data is available, how can we live like that? Right. And I actually think that we're in this moment, um, we're sort of like in this moment, almost like in 1776 or 1787, where we have to figure out what's going to be the way we protect our privacy. Um, So I don't have the answers, but stay on the pulse. And I think there are people actually trying to develop ways for, for like private transactions. But the key is, you also have to figure out well how do you Stop. keep the bad actors yeah, yeah, from yeah, using yeah. it too that's where that's the big issue somebody oh sorry jack not to interrupt um you're familiar mm-hmm. with shannon uh former agency she oh, does yeah, lockdown yeah, yeah. your life um if you go to lockdown your life on instagram she is a former a good friend of mine former agency um she uh specializes in security and privacy and it says protecting privacy profit and peace of mind um, mm. security, online safety slash OSINT and investigation. So she might be oh. somebody that can help with that as well. And somebody you might even want to hook up with. She's, she's really good yeah. at her stuff. So it's locked down your life. That's locked the down your for... life. Yeah. On Instagram. And, oh, man. uh, James B asks, not sure if he's allowed to answer. How did analytical methodology evolve over your time in the agency? Hmm, how did it evolve? I mean, yeah. I mean, what can I so yeah, it gets it gets into a whole ball of wax. I guess it depends, you know. Um, yeah, I'm not sure what I can say. I, mean, I think it's it's. I think I can make the general observation that, um, you know, well, what has evolved? You know, just think about what has it just evolved generally in terms of. I think I sort of talked about it when I was talking about open source, OSINT, open source Intel is is huge, and it's so funny because I think that's where I was like back in like 2008, 2009. Um, it was kind of weird to like be doing stuff, you know, I think, and, and so be so into open source. Whereas now, I mean, the s- open source is probably, and actually, let me just speak. I'm speaking not from knowing because I haven't been in there for 10 years. So for 10 plus years. So um, what I imagine is going to be so different is just the availability of, of all these sources. And um, and OSINT, so OSINT has become like a respectable int now, right? It's a respectable form of of collection that has its own trade craft. Um, you know, there was, I actually put together, I have my own like spreadsheet of all these OSINT tools, which are probably outdated by now. I mean, I made it like, you know, several years ago when I was doing a lot of this, uh, these investigations. Um, Bellingcat has a very good um, the Bellingcat organization. They do a lot of investigative reporting and they have like a, a Google spreadsheet that has like all these OSINT tools that investigators could use. Um, so that's, that's probably a big thing, but you know, I think you just think about the all the things that are new. Just assume, like AI, I'm sure is sh- shaking up the game. You know, um, uh, you know, social media, that you know, social media becoming bigger. Like all the what are, of the things that that you see, but the basics in trade. I mean, all of that though. I think in terms of analytic methodology, you still have basics basic sort of analysis, like the things that you would do to um, check your assumptions and. Uh, and certain techniques, you know, I'm sure certain tech, there are like, this is not classified because I mean, again, I, I, I love talking about stuff that because often I've like written, presented on it and I've gotten it cleared, you know, like there, there's, I think online, there's like a structured analytic methodology from the CIA, like an uh, 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 unclassified uh, open source version that, that at least used to be out there a few, a few years ago where they have different analytic techniques that we used to use that are, that, that, you know, have been written about in the public. So um, I know a lot of that stuff is is still there, but yeah, just think about how how technology is changing, and that'll probably help. Uh, 
we got one last question from uh, Gen 3 Kali. He asks, to what extent has the relationship between Zakzaki and Iran contributed to the rise of Islamic extremism in Nigeria directly or as a geopolitical locus of contention between Iran and uh, Sunni jihadists? I don't know Zazaki. Zazaki, is that from, is that the uh, ISIS guy? Uh, I, I honestly don't, remember. don't know either, I'm afraid. Okay. It may, maybe because, because, um, because, you know, there was, um, there was Boko Haram and then the ISIS, uh, the West African ISIS. Maybe that's the guy. I'm, I'm not sure. But, but no, because you're, I don't know. I don't know. Um, yeah, I don't know much about Iran and, well, especially Iran and, and Nigeria. Um, but that's, I mean, but but the only thing I would say, which I kind of touched on, is this concern about what's happening in Africa. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, I think there are plenty of other experts, military generals who, who've been pointing this out um, and other experts that that's where the jihadist movement has had this this new life. I mean, I remember when I started seeing things like Mozambique. Right. You know, Mozambique. I mean, again, Mozambique, again, has, has always had a, a Muslim population right right there on the Indian coast, you know, the Indian Ocean, the coast of Africa. Um, but then and in the Congo, like the, you know, jihadist groups in these areas have become active. And again, I have not been I, I, I don't follow these movements as part of my day to day job. Um, but, you know, so we should st I think we, we just have to be vigilant. That you know the world is you know continues to be a, a very a dangerous place. Um, you know these these problems aren't necessarily going away. Um, if I were to say something like, especially to the viewers who you know, I mean, you you meet you know, you meet a Muslim in counterterrorism, right? And it's like you know, man, you know, they're you know we're not you you I don't know maybe you wish there were more or something like that. But um, I think the thing I will say is that th that's why I'm, I men mentioned what I said about the U.S. and how we. I'm, I'm concerned that we don't let things we don't let things get warped because the benefit of the U.S. has been, you know, we have had our problems. We have had lone wolves. We have had people join ISIS. We, we've had radicalization definitely um, over the past decade plus. Um, but in the at least in the U.S., we have a little bit of a buffer because we've had such stability and the, the Muslim community is integrated and is you know thriving and. And um, you think about it, people talk about 9-11, oh, is it bad to be a Muslim? Since 9-11, you, you have more mosques, you have more Islamic schools in, in a very flourishing, good way. Um, and, and so life to be a Muslim in America is, a, is there's, this is a place where you can live your religion and be a part of the fabric of our community. So I think that that's good. And so, you know, if I can do anything is, is, is to, you know, hopefully, you know, promote that and to have that continue to exist um you know i think maybe that's the message i would end on yeah. you know thank you thank you so much yaya and you. um you know this has been an awesome interview and i mean do you have any any final thoughts anything i really failed to cover or anything else you want to plug before we we get going um you know i i just want to say i mean well i'm just i appreciate you you guys i mean this has just been a great conversation i didn't uh, realize we would talk. i was like eh, maybe an hour <laughs> 15 minutes but you you got me to just talk um so i really appreciate the opportunity to be on this program it's a great show hope thank everyone you. is subscribed and all that thank you so much and the listeners those questions man i really appreciate that people are asking you know at, that they ask those questions and uh, yeah the only thing i think i would just plug Give Jabari the Jabari Lincoln Files uh, a try. You know it's on all the plat platforms. Um, you know Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Audible, etc. So I'm really looking for people to listen and give it a review. And if, if anyone needs a final push, you get to hear Yaya rap at the end of the episode. I did not know that part. I haven't gotten to that part yet. So oh, you're man. lucky we're running out of time because I was going to make you spit right now oh man. Uh, we, 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 yeah oh we're running out of time oh, plus you don't have, you don't have, oh darn you don't, you don't have an instrumental so it's like it's jack like beatboxes so you know <laughs> next time i guess that, i guess i gotta prepare for the next yeah time. the next yeah, one man, exactly you gotta warm up your vocal cords for that uh <laughs> exactly, exactly. well thank you thank you again man really appreciate you spending some of your friday evening with us um again i hope people go check out the jabari lincoln files i'm looking forward to finishing it over the next week uh next uh this coming monday we'll be back here with uh brad thomas in studio um so we're happy to have him come on the show yeah yeah again thank you man thank you and uh please stay in touch yeah. man we'll, we'll be happy to have you on yeah. again sometime down the line i appreciate it i'm looking forward to it thanks guys have, have a great weekend everybody